Bay, you'll see Dave Winfield and the New York Yankees against the Chicago White Sox, who have exchanged power for speed from Comiskey Park. Four from venerable Fenway Park in Boston. The Kansas City Royals against the powerful lineup of the Boston Red Sox. Then it's golf, and sweet swinging Sammy C is among the great names playing in the legends of golf. But up first, NBC Sports presents Major League Baseball. An inside look at baseball and a preview of today's Game of the Week. Brought to you by Miller Beer. Miller, made the American way since 1855. And by Midas. For brakes, mufflers, and shots, trust the Midas cut. Hello, everyone. I'm Bill McAtee in our NBC Sports studios in New York. Baseball coming up in about 20 minutes. But first, we want to bring you up to date on a story that has concerned the front office of the San Diego Padres. Thursday night before the Padres game with the Dodgers, second baseman Alan Wiggins disappeared. He still had not reappeared yesterday afternoon when club president Ballard Smith called a press conference. Alan talked to his agent this morning, and we are now attempting to get a hold of Alan. And as soon as we've had a chance to talk to him, we'll determine what his status will be with the ball club. Wiggins, who signed a four-year, $2 million contract this past offseason, is still not with the club, and it's not known if he'll be in uniform for today's game against the Dodgers. Padres lost their game last night at Dodger Stadium, and fans out in L.A. saw a masterful one-hit pitching performance from Oral Hershiser. Hershiser faced the minimum number of hitters, 27, and the shutout extends his streak of scoreless innings to 22. In Chicago, Tom Seaver allowed only one earned run in seven innings, picking up career victory number 290. Receiver received some excellent defensive help. Watch Julio Cruz get to the ball at the foul line and then make the catch. Ed Whitson of the Yankees had a no-hitter going until the sixth. That's when the White Sox broke it open. With two men on, Harold Baines hit his fourth home run of the young season, and the White Sox went on to win it by a score of 4-2. to two. Of course, some of you will get a chance to see the Yankees and the White Sox today. There has been much talk about the future of Yankee manager Yogi Berra. We talked of Alan Wiggins, who wasn't with the Padres. Many expected Berra to be gone by this weekend. We'll talk with Yogi from Chicago right after this. As we said, uh, some of you today will see the Yankees and the White Sox from Chicago. The Yankees have struggled at 6-8, and eight, and there's been a great deal of speculation about the future of Yogi Berra. That despite the fact the season is only 14 games old. But the speculation has continued, and Lynn Berman is with Yogi in Chicago. Thank you, Bill. We're with Yogi before just the 15th game of the season. And the question has to be asked, are you on the verge of being fired? Well, I'm still there, Lynn, and... Uh... You know, he's the boss. I, I've told, uh, told that to the writers uh, all along. I know I've been getting it all week, and uh, I'm still managing. And I'm not going to resign either, and, uh, and it's up to him. He's the boss. Have you thought at all about resigning? You brought it up. No, I didn't. haven't thought of anything about resigning. I love this game too much. Is it unfair that this talk should be going on after just 14 games of a baseball season? Well, uh, you got to get used to it, and I'm used to it. Hearing the same questions all the time. I think I should write a letter and just hand it to the writers. <laughs> Have you talked to George recently? No, I haven't talked to him. Uh, last Monday I talked to him. That was about it. Mm -hmm. How is all of this affecting the club, Yogi? Well, that part I don't know. They're going out to do the job. Uh, right now I know we're not getting the hits at the right time. We're hitting the ball good. When we do hit it good, it's right at somebody. Have you thought for a moment of ever saying to George, last year I did well in the second half. It was an, you know, an unusual year with the Detroit Tigers. Give me one full year. Get off my back. No, well, the, that don't bother. I'll tell you the truth, Lenny. I, I just go out and do my job. I'm out of the park early and uh, I like it. And, uh, See, uh, talk to the boys and everything, you know, go out and do the job. So you plan on being around for a little while? Well, I hope I am. <laughs> so if it's not over till it's over, it's not over yet for well, Yogi Berra. Well, right now it isn't. Uh, like I said, I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Yogi, all the best. Yeah, thank you, man. Okay. Back to you, Bill. All right, Lenny, George Steinbrenner knows the Yankees are engaged in a war for attention with the Mets. Certainly a managerial change or speculation that Billy Martin could be back doesn't hurt generate publicity. Now, earlier this week, after a much publicized trial, former Cy Young Award winner Denny McClain was sentenced. McClain, the last major league pitcher to win 30 games in a season, Thursday was sentenced to 23 years in federal prison for loan sharking, bookmaking, extortion, and drug possession. Denny McClain said later, I don't know how you get to where I was today, from where I was 17 years ago. Last Sunday afternoon, Willie Hernandez became the first Detroit pitcher to bat in almost a decade. 
When a lineup change forced Hernandez to the plate, Hernandez showed his place is indeed on the mound. In Anaheim, another pitcher, rookie Bob Kipper, made a classic rookie mistake, cutting off Bob Boone's throw to second on a steal attempt by Mike Keith. Kipper making a catch that shouldn't have been, Mike Davis missing a grab that could have been, landing hard in the seat, going after a home run ball from Jerry Nairn. Yankees, White Sox, Boston, Kansas City, one of those coming up. And in a moment, we'll look at the NBA playoffs and have a preview of the legends of golf. We'll be back to New York in a moment. Thank you. You know, there was some speculation in the offseason that the San Francisco Giants might become the latest sports franchise to change cities. Bob Lurie saying he didn't believe the Bay Area market was big enough to support both the Giants and the A's. Also talk of a dome stadium. Here's Lynn Berman. Freezing candlestick night games. The Giants tried to take advantage of that in their commercial. Hey, medic. I can't feel my leg. Hey, easy, kid, easy. Cold beer. To those valiant few who endure an extra inning night game, this year, once again, the Giants present the quad to candlestick. But also this year, the Giants have switched to mostly day games and groundskeepers in Hawaiian shirts and new commercials. This year, Giants fans will experience something new. give away muscle shirts, we'll give away uh, suntan lotion, we're going to dress the ground crew in Hawaiian shirts. It, it's, uh, you know, it's all part of the theme, but I think the real point is, is that uh, what we're trying to get across is day baseball is a great way to come spend the day, and Candlestick Park is a real friendly place during the day, unlike it is at night. You've had cold commercials for night games, hot commercials for day games. What is next? Well, we've promised them every kind of baseball we can think of. One, we've promised them, uh, you know, winter baseball, and now we're promising them summer baseball. And if this doesn't work, we're all going to have one alternative, and that's to promise them winning baseball, which is pretty radical, but uh, I think it's worth a try. But day or night at Candlestick, the Giants continue to struggle with the elements. I've discovered that financially I can do better off playing the day games because uh, I only had to buy one pair of long johns this year and one pair of long wool sleeves, so I found out I could save a lot of money by uh, playing these day games. Now, I like night games. I don't care how cold it is out here. Really? I like playing under the lights. Uh, I think, you know, that's modern baseball, and, you know, I'm a modern baseball player. But the real issue at Candlestick is not day or night games, but any games at all. Will the Giants move out? There's even talk of doming Candlestick. The running joke in San Francisco is putting a dome on Candlestick is like putting lipstick on a pig. In fact, the Giants dislike the idea of a dome candlestick so much, they've even made a funny commercial about that. My guest is Don Dufus of the architectural firm of Dufus and Dorquet. Uh, Mike, as you can see, our firm has developed a boldly innovative approach towards shielding Candlestick Park from the cold night winds here. Now, the Dufus Dome is retractable. And as you can see, there's kind of a hinge arrangement here, Mike. Mm -hmm. I see it's a multi-use facility. Yes, there's a playing field as well as the basketball arena and the concert hall here. And for the occasional daytime baseball game, the dome is supported in its open position by a massive four-pronged structural member. Sort of a fork shape. It is a fork shape, yes. Do you want a dome? No, I want uh, 45 to 48,000 seat stadium with good weather, good parking, good access. So you don't want a dome, you want to stay in the area, and should the A's move to Denver or somewhere else, you wouldn't mind moving into the Oakland Coliseum. That could be a possibility, but I, you know, I don't want to hurt the people in San Jose or San Mateo, Redwood City, because they have worked hard and we are pursuing our negotiations with them. So in the meantime, Giants fans continue loyal. They love their Giants, and they love Candlestick. You know, the thing is that we grew up with Candlestick being the way it is, and as somebody said it, maybe a dump, but it's our dump. You know, this is the, what we're used to for sports. And so the Giants may still be in last place in the National League West, but they're in first place in their fans' hearts and in their commercials. Len Berman at Candlestick. All right, Lenny, the Giants, by the way, scored six runs in the ninth to beat Cincinnati 7-6 to six on Dan Gladden's two-out, three-run home run. Coming up next, you'll see either the Yankees and the White Sox, Boston and Kansas City. Baseball is next on NBC. Stay with us. His name is Don Mattingly. He's 24 years old and last year won the American League batting championship when he hit 343. He was named the American League Player of the Year by the Sporting News. 
His name is Harold Baines, 26 years old, the most prolific left-handed home run hitter in White Sox history. They meet today as the Chicago White Sox host the New York Yankees. in Chicago, Illinois, the NBC Game of the Week presents the New York Yankees versus the Chicago White Sox. Hi, everybody. I'm Vin Scully, along with Joe Garagiola. Sure, it's Dennis Rasmussen pitching for the Yankees, and it's Tim Lala working for the Chicago White Sox. But, Joe, that's just not the story here. It really isn't. In fact, whenever I can't remember in recent years doing a Yankee game where we just talk about the game there's always turmoil now it's uh yogi's job is on the line 15 games into the season and they're a crucial series according to george steinbrenner and of course here in chicago i guess outside of yogi tony la Russa takes more heat than anybody else at least in the papers everyone is guessing that he's on the spot despite the fact the Sox were so great two years ago well and and uh, of course i can't be that objective about yogi growing up with the guy but when you you stop to think about it the second half he had why not give him a chance there's a lot going on here. We'll check the lineups and talk more about it right after this. Just furnished by Major League Baseball in cooperation with the Players Association. Hi, I'm Willie Wilson. And I want to tell you something important, and it's about drugs. I don't want you young people to make the same mistakes I made. Drug use can start very innocently, and before you know it, you're in over your head. Once you're involved in drugs, you don't realize how many people you're going to hurt. Any friend who offers you drugs is really not a true friend. Remember, make the right choice. Say no to drugs. Baseball cares about you and your family. Hi, I'm Don Mattingly of New York Yankees. We bring you today's lineups from Chili Comiskey Park. Leading off today will be Ricky Henderson, our speedy center fielder. Batting second will be the most consistent second baseman in baseball, Willie Randolph. I'll be hitting third today, playing first base. In right field today will be number, hitting fourth for us will be Big Dave Winfield, probably the best athlete in baseball. Hitting fifth, Big Don Baylor. Sixth will be Billy Sample, acquisition we picked up from Texas this year. Hitting seventh, playing third will be Dale Boo Boo Barra. Eighth will be our catcher, Butch Weininger. The ninth will be the speedy shortstop Bobby Meacham. Today's left-handed pinch hitter off the bench will be Big Ron Hassey. As the Chicago White Sox take the field, let's take a look at those fellows with the leather. This is not one of uh, Tony LaRusso's uh, favorite lineups, but he's got some people he's resting and he's got some injuries. At any rate, Pachorek will be in left field. Salazar, good range, a very strong arm. No worries out there, according to Tony LaRusso, with him in center field. Baines, an underrated outfield in right field. Fletcher, Guillen is the shortstop. He pronounces his name Guillen, but everybody's pronouncing it Guillen, so it's Guillen, the shortstop. Cruz is the second baseman. Walker is at first base. Hill is the catcher, and Tim Lawler, a former Yankee in San Diego Padre, is the pitcher. And I don't want to put Don Mattingly down with his estimate of the weather. He said it was uh, chilly. It's 44 degrees here, so that makes it cold. Yes, sir. 
Tim Lawler tuning up with a record of one and one coming off perhaps his finest game since he came over to the American League in the Lamar Hoyt deal and went sent Lamar to San Diego his first White Sox victory he went seven innings against the Red Sox allowed just one run that was a home run by Tony Armas he struck out seven and walked just two Lawler when he was in the National League was an excellent hitter because he won't have much of an opportunity over in the American League unless they use him as a pinch hitter ironically the first major league home run Tim Lawler ever hit he hit it against his now teammate Tom Seaver <laughs> as a pitcher Lawler doesn't have any trick pitches he's got a good thinker the slider is what makes his game easy or a tough game. If he gets that in the spots he wants to get uh, the slider, he'll have an easy game. That uh, you might as well call it his outfit. The slider and a good fastball, and that's Tim Lawler. Well, we'll see about Tim Lawler. He'll be pitching to Ricky Henderson, followed by Willie Randolph and then Don Mattingly. You might have heard Mattingly uh, call Dale Barra Boo Boo. Dale Boo Boo Barra, of course, they're playing off the cartoon strip, Yogi and Boo Boo. And that's what the guys have. And, of course, these are trying days for Yogi. It's also trying days for Ricky Henderson, to be honest. After all, a much publicized, high-priced ball player coming over from Oakland. And Henderson, who had been injured, is off to a slow start with his 18 at-bats. He has only two hits. And, of course, any time you talk about Ricky, you immediately look at the stolen base column, and he does have two steals. He's got those last night. So for Ricky Henderson, the spearhead of the attack, and Tim Lawler with a pretty good move. So if Henderson gets on, why they will certainly be testing each other considerably. And talking to Ricky, it's interesting. He only gets a three and a half step lead off first base. And when I said most guys get five, he said, well, if I get three and a half, it doesn't look like a big lead. And I'm running just as fast as I can with the second step. So it does make a lot of sense not to get the big lead, draw throws, and constantly diving back to the bag if indeed you run as fast as Ricky Henderson. If you hadn't looked at the box scores or the story of last night's game, won by the White Sox 4-2, it was a most frustrating Yankee defeat because in the process, they left 14 men on base. So Henderson, a spearhead, trying to get aboard and shake him up. Remember, he's had three seasons of 100 stolen bases. And Lawler about ready, and here we go. Starts him with a fastball and misses, and we're underway. 1-0. Tim Lawler, born in 1956. And he's a little low, ball two. If you get the impression with that center field shot that Lawler is pitching downhill or from the top of the mountain, not a bad impression because that mound is a high mound. And that's low, so he starts off wobbly, does Lawler, with a three ball, no strike count. Now the mound technically is supposed to be 10 inches high, but how they slope it's another story. That's right. But if they measured that, it wouldn't be 10 inches high. 3 0. Oh. And he's walked him, and look out now. have the base paths here are harder it's a fast track and the reason i say that coming out early i noticed the way they watered the infield they watered all the infield except the base paths themselves they were left dry so it is a hard track it'll be to ricky henderson's advantage well henderson at first held on by greg walker randolph takes ball one so lawler having trouble hasn't hit the strike zone yet randolph has been hurting not just with that 222 average he has had a stress fracture of the foot. Although he is playing somewhat in pain, he gives you his best shot all the time. And there goes Henderson. The pitch outside. He'll throw. Gets off the glove of Cruz. However, backed up by Guillen and holding on is Henderson. You had a great picture of the jump that Henderson got off Tim Lawler, even though he's a left-hander. Lawler gave him a look right there as one of the and with that first couple of steps accelerated to, well, Hill had to actually throw flat-footed, and you could see that even if the play is made at second base, Henderson's going to beat it with that head-first slide. For Ricky Henderson, his third stolen base 
You know, the Yankees have not had a player steal 50 bases since the late George Snuffy Sternwhite back in 1944. That's where Ricky is with the active players, number two. And, of course, Ricky Henderson, a young man, he's going to steal an awful lot more before he's through. He's only 26 years old. So Randolph now trying to move him over. Because of that foot, he's using the head first slide again. Two balls, no strike. A high strike. Letter high outside part of the plate. Randolph shaking his head. No, no, no. Two and one. One foul back. And the count two and two. Henderson likes to run off second base as much as he does off first base, although he does get a bigger lead. But you can see with Randolph, Randolph the batter, nobody out, that he's going to just uh, wait and see what happens. The doctors have recommended that he slides head first to protect that uh, injury that he had. And uh, he was pretty successful with his feet first slide, but to protect it, he's going head first. Two and two to Willie. Ball hit slowly to short, charging Glee, and he has to go to first. And Henderson moves up a notch to third. The ball was not hit hard enough for Ozzie to make a play at third. So the Yankees have Henderson at third with one out, and now Don Mattingly coming up. Henderson didn't hesitate, did he? As soon as that gone. ball was hit, he was gone. And usually they say make the ball go through if it's on the left side of the infield. Not Henderson. He knew he could make it, and he took off. You know, it's interesting, this early in the season, the White Sox are a game and a half out of first place. The Yankees are three games out. A year ago, the Yankees were nine games out. So they have improved. So with a runner at third, we'll see what Mattingly does. He probably bangs it. It slices, and it's grabbed by Salazar. Here comes Ricky. Good throw. He's in there. Boy, what a fine throw. Salazar has a strong arm, as we mentioned. Uh, Tony Russo said he's uh, just a natural athlete, and he made a good throw. Comes into the ball, and he gets good stuff on it. Mark Hill has got the plate blocked well, but Henderson with that great speed. I think that Ron Hasty, when he played against Henderson, had a great line. He says a lot of times you think you're going to get him, but it's a mirage. And there it is with the outfielder making the throw and Henderson slide. For the Yankees, it is really what they needed. After stranding 14 men last night, their leadoff man gets on and comes around to score. And Winfield takes a strike. From Mattingly, his seventh RBI, Winfield and Baylor each have two home runs. And Winfield with a half a dozen RBIs. Change up. Good pitch at the knees outside corner. Just to carry your thoughts one step farther, uh, Vin, you're so right what the Yankees needed because it was a manufactured run. A walk, a stolen base, a ground ball, and a sacrifice fly. So he made that run by himself. Here's Big Dave, incredible athlete when you look at his background. Big chopper foul outside of third. Can you imagine having so much athletic ability that when you come out of the University of Minnesota, you're drafted in three different sports, the Padres drafted him in baseball, Minnesota drafted him in football, Utah, and the Atlanta basketball team of the NBA also drafted him. I mean, that's a multi-talented guy. He's 6'6 six, six and 220. One and two to count. You can describe him many ways as a baseball player, but the one thing that I really like about him, and young players can take a page out of his book, he thinks two bases. When he hits the ball, he's looking for two bases. Interesting, too, last year, Mattingly and Winfield together were hitless in only 10 games, and the Yankees lost nine of the 10. So if you stop those two, the chances are you will have stopped the Yankees. A very, very light drizzle now begins to fall. Ground ball to short. Guillen picks it up and throws him out. So the Yankees get a run on a walk, a stolen base, and a fly ball. 1-0 New York at the end of half an inning. And here come the Sox. Here's the way the Chicago White Sox stack up. Second base leading off Julio Cruz. And over a third, Scott Fletcher. In right field, Harold Baines. And in left field, Tom Pashore. The designated hitter who caught all the way last night 
So they're resting him in that respect is Carlton Fisk. Behind the plate, spelling Fisk is Mark Hill. At first, Greg Walker. In center field, you already saw his arm, Luis Salazar. And the shortstop, Ozzie Green. Here's the way the Yankees will line up uh, defensively. Billy Sample is in left field, came over from Texas. Henderson is in center field, and Winfield is in right field. And this outfield, well, like most of them, because of Henderson's injury, most of the combinations have not played together. Dale Barra is the third. Meacham is the shortstop. Randolph is the steady man at second base. Manningley at first base. Weiniger, Weiniger, Weiniger is the <laughs> catcher. And Rasmussen, imagine me butchering the catcher's name. Why don't you just call it. him Butch and let it go at the yeah. end? Take a look at the left-hander by the name of Dennis Rasmussen, making his third start of the year. You can see his record is 0 and 1. And by the way, the Yankees have given him a run. The Yankees have lost three straight season series to the White Sox. The last time the Yankees won a season series against Chicago was in 1981. So we'll see how Dennis goes now that he's been staked to a run. He's got an excellent curveball, fastball in the slider, no trick pitches. The slider's not very much. In fact, I don't think he'll throw it much to the right-hand batter. Control and tempo, those are the keys. He's six foot seven. He's a big guy, so when something gets out of sync, that's a lot of body to be out of sync. It's interesting, Tim Lawler coming out of the San Diego organization and pitching today for the White Sox. Dennis Rasmussen went to spring training last year with San Diego. And he's pitching to Julio Cruz. Ball one, one and all. Oh. Rasmussen went to Creighton, Creighton University. He missed his last turn. He had a touch of the flu. He's six seven. Uh, he's got a lot of elbows and kneecaps coming at you. And the count, one ball and one strike. Rasmussen came to the Yankees in the deal that sent Greg Nettles to San Diego. Good fastball, and he just got him one and two. Rasmussen struck out nine last year for his high, and it was against the Chicago White Sox. Then he went against Seattle and struck out ten. So as the modern-day ball player says, he can bring it. One and two. Two and two. And you talk about baseball in a family. If you're old enough to remember an infielder by the name of Billy Brubaker, played with the Pirates and the Boston Braves, well, Dennis is his grandson. to the count. Tony La Russa, the youngest manager right behind him, however, is Doug Rader. Three and two. And he's walked the leadoff man. You might have been wondering what kind of a sign could he be given with uh, three and two on the batter and nobody on base. What he probably was doing was giving a sign what would happen if Cruz would get on and Cruz is on, so there is a play in order. A play in order indeed. We should point out how effective Julio Cruz has been stealing bases. As Scotty Fletcher gets in with that 208 average, Cruz has stolen 22 out of 24 in his career against the Yankees. And a good bunt, but it's on the chalk. It is going to stay fair, fair, foul. That is most unusual because I'll tell you I came out early and I do this in every ballpark and it's an old catcher's habit is you check in front of home plate it was wet down because of the sinker ball pitcher Lawler the lines are tilted in that ball going foul is it started to stay fair you can see it and the only thing that could have helped it if they would have put another coat of whitewash on there which they have done and there's nothing wrong with it but it is tilted in and I'm surprised that ball went foul. And it's a tribute to the Bossard family, I think the dean of groundkeepers, beginning with Emil in Cleveland, Harold and Marshall who were there, the sons, and of course Gene who was here with the White Sox, and now Roger, his son. They talked to Tony La Russa, and they're like a tenth man on the ball club if you got a Bossard around. The throw to first, not in time. So we already then see the Bossard family imprint here the mound and now suddenly the way the infield is in front of home plate the mound the base pass and the uh, lines i see four things already oh and one to count another throw and cruz able to read mass rasmussen you know because he's so tall it's almost like watching a hook and ladder unravel it takes a while for him to get over there he looks like an easy pitcher to read we'll see and he's got him picked off as soon as i say that see you later julio 
he gave him such a lulling bad move over there that he sold him on it. He's got two moves, no question about it. This is his good move right there. You see him look towards the plate. They call it a half balk move, which always brings up Jock O'Connell's line. What's a half balk? You can be halfway between first and second. It's either a balk or it's not. But he looked at the plate. Cruz broke. That was his good move. And the way you run on him is because of his slow delivery on the plate, not because of his move. He's got a good move. So Scott Fletcher now with a count 0 and 1 takes 1 and 1. And of course, when you talk about half balk in the National League, the first name that comes to mind is Steve Carlton. Oh, right. Any good move is borderline. Uh, balk move. One and one. And the bunt fouled away. One and two. You know, Ben, getting back to the Fossett family, last night when I saw the field and I saw the way it was cut, it looked beautiful. Any other field that didn't have the Bossard signature on it, I would have said cosmetic. Mm -hmm. But I said there's a reason. Got to be a reason. Oddly enough, there wasn't a reason as you look at that cut. It just looks nice. One and two the count. You know, there's so much history here at Comiskey Park celebrating its 75th anniversary. And one reason why it is the way it is, is the New York Yankees. I'll tell you why in a minute. Half swing, and that's going to be strike three. It originally was called White Sox Park, then they changed it to Comiskey Park. And the major changes took place in the middle 20s when the popularity of the Yankees, led by Ruth and Gehrig, always drew overflow crowds. So they have replaced the wooden bleachers with permanent steel and concrete structure. The outfield pavilions were double-decked. The present bleacher structure was built, all because of the Yankees and their all their big draw here. Young Harold Baines at 26. Today we're looking at the two top left-hand hitters in the American League. Harold Baines, and Don Mattingly. A one hopper at third, staying with it is Dale Barra to get him. So the White Sox are on the line, and at the end of an inning, the Yankees won, and Chicago nothing. He is really as much a part of the New York scene as the Empire State Building. When you realize that he has been involved with the Yankees and or the Mets since 1947. His name is Lawrence Yogi Berra. What did you call him when you were kids growing up on the hill? Yogi? No, no. Lottie. What was it? Lottie. How, how do you spell that? Well, I guess L-A-W-D-Y, but his mother couldn't say Lawrence. She called him Lottie. Lottie. Linka. Linka. <laughs> oh, Lordy, Lordy. Lordy. Well, here's Don Baylor. And Baylor fouls it back out of play on the count 0-1. Look at this picture. Now, can you find Joe and Yogi? Well, we're going to help you out. First of all, here's Joe. Good-looking guy. Look at all that hair. Yeah. Oh, man. And then who could ever mistake Yogi for being Yogi? Stang. 1-1. One one. How long ago was that picture taken? I about? guess we were 12, 13 years old. Ben Pucci was in there. All, no, all the guys, obviously, but he was a football player, professional football guy. Mm. Big guy in the back there. Nana, River. Little looper into right field. Going out is Julio Cruz, but it's a little flare, and it drops for a single. So Baylor is aboard, and the batter will be Billy Sample. You know, Baylor's always being hit by pitches, and he has finally popped off about it. Baylor told the Boston Red Sox he's sick and tired of being hit and he was going to get somebody if he didn't get a pitcher he would get somebody so the words out in the American League Baylor at 6-1 and 2-10 is fed up with it he's been hit 170 times I'd be fed up by then too here's Billy Sample big guys are all such nice guys and boy do we thank our lucky stars for that Baylor is one he's got a good housekeeping seal somewhere on that body I mean he's such a nice guy otherwise look out so big Lawler trying to keep Baylor close in case the Yankees have a play on and they've shortened up the corners Scott Fletcher at third and Greg Walker ready to push off the bag and come to the plate hitting 231 as he stands at the plate. Away, ball two. Two and oh. 
It is cold, as we mentioned earlier, 44 degrees. I would think it will be particularly difficult to hold on to the ball because your hands get slick in cold weather. You can see how well dressed and bundled up the fans are. You've got to keep your hands warm to grip the ball. As a pitcher, you'd like to saw the bat off in their hands, too, or hit them right on the end of that bat because that'll put the bees into their hands and they won't be so anxious to come up and hit the next time. So Tim Waller working on Billy Sample. It's one nothing Yankees. We're in the top of the second inning. Fastball fouled away and he was trying to take him to right field. He kept the ball away. So Sample thought he'd go with it and fouled it off. Two and one. Everyone is well aware of the vast changes. Yeah, we'll watch Lawler trying to get a handle on that thing. The Yankees have made great changes on their roster. You know, the Mets changed something like 12 of 25 by opening day this year. The Yankees did the same thing. There were 12 of their 25 on the opening day list that were not on the team in the beginning of 84. And of course, that also includes two who are on the disabled. He's got some ideas about wanting to run. Uh, Yankees have not been stealing a lot, but they do play hit and run. Stay away from that double play. He caught Baylor leaning. Coaching at third is, well, they used to call him the stick. Gene Michael, and over at first, Carl Merrill. The first base is Stump Merrill, so they got stick and stump. <laughs> Two and one. Breaking ball and it just seemed to slide on the corner. Good pitch, two and two. Sound like a cartoon, huh? Stick and stump with Yogi. Stump. Pick and pass. Frick and frack. <laughs> There's Stump Merrill. The Yankees leading one nothing in case you just joined us. We're in the top of the second inning. Two balls, two strikes. Spin a little breaking ball down, and he has now gone all the way. So we'll see about Baylor going. The first thought is whether Sample is a contact hitter or not. The way Sample was looking, you got to look for him to be gone. By the way, Baylor only stole one base last year. Uno. So we'll watch. He goes. Pitch beaten foul. Right into the seats behind the White Sox dugout. So Big Baylor comes back to first. Still checking with Michael to see if that run and hit play is on. I'm surprised that uh, he didn't throw. Well, you just saw Michael say, uh, watch him throwing over there. He was just trying to get the sign from Yogi. Now he's passing it on. But I'm surprised Lawler didn't throw over there because he had Baylor leaning at one other time. And if you're not running all the time, uh, you're liable to catch him leaning the wrong way. If I were catching, I'd motion to throw over there at least once. Well, let's see if the big guy's going three and two to sample. And they're going over there. I heard a great story. I'm not going to talk about the player, but there was a player in the National League who was having some trouble with signs. His son was sitting in the ballpark with his grandfather, and each time the player, some player would get on base, his son would say, he's going. I know he's going. There he goes. And there's a high, twisting foul ball down the left field line, and that will go back into the seats out of play. Anyway, the little kid, he was eight, nine years old, he would call every running play. And the grandfather said, how do you know that? The kid said, I know the signs. Huh? So the eight-year-old knew the signs, and the father was having trouble with them. <laughs> signs are not that difficult. They really aren't. It's just that some guys just can't concentrate. I believe that. I, I still think Pepper Martin had the great system when he managed Sacramento. He put up signs, printed on them, bunt, <laughs> steal, and the guys could read it, but nobody believed him. He'd hold up the sign, run. Three and two, the count. To have Billy Sample waiting. We'll see about Baylor. He goes, and there's ball four, and so Lawler is in a mess again. First and second, and nobody out, and Lawler has walked two. And now you get Barra, Weiniger, and Meacham. The best sign I ever saw was at Shea Stadium. The Mets were struggling. It was in the early days. And the Dodgers were in there, and I think Drysdale was the pitcher. And the leadoff guy for the Dodgers, I, I believe, got a home run or an extra base hit, and a fan stood up with a huge sign that said, wait till next year. This is the first batter opening day. <laughs> two, 
Two on and nobody out. And, of course, the Sox are looking bunt, so Walker ready to come to the plate. Guillen is trying to bird dog Baylor a little bit and cut down his lead. And we'll see what Barra does. Looking at a strike. Guillen does a good job of that because he doesn't just dance his way there. He charges towards that runner, which indicates that he, there is a play on, and he's got the runner going back. He had, him, he had Baylor leaning back twice. you got to like that young fella. Good baseball instincts. There he goes charging. 0-1. Oh Slow curveball. Hit down the right field line. Slicing in the corner. Foul. And drops untouched. And the count 0-2. Oh so Ozzie Gwynn trying to bird dog Don Baylor. And Billy Sample holding it first. Now the name is G-U-I-L-L-E-N. When he first came here, he said the name should be pronounced Guillen. But they said, hey, you're in America. It's going to be Guillen. He is the third shortstop to play here from Venezuela, Chico Carrasquel, and then the Hall of Famer, Luis Aparicio. So this kid has a, a great act to follow, but he's only 21 years old. 0-2. One ball, two strikes. We were talking about his name yesterday. I said, well, we're going to say Guillen. He said, but my daddy watches the game in Venezuela. He won't know who you're talking about. <laughs> Baylor at second and Sample at first. Nobody out on the second. One to nothing, Yankees. That ball. At the knees on the corner. And Barra caught looking. Boy, that's a killer to take a two-strike fastball just about down the middle of the pipe. He just couldn't pull the trigger on it. He gets a good look at it. No doubt about it. So one away, and the batter, Butch Weiniger who homered against Lawler in the Yankees' home opener. Butch hitting 298. That's his only home run, and eight RBI. 0-1. Oh, so Lawler trying to fight his way out of a jam. Baylor opened up with a little pop fly, as the modern player calls it, a flare to right field. It's raining in Chicago now. It's no longer just a... a couple of drops it's raining so in 44 degree weather it is raining and we're very close i'm sure to having it turn to snow one and one tried to change off the breaking ball two balls and one strike what's going on elsewhere kansas city leading the red sox two nothing in the second inning Nothing, Yankees. We're in the second with one out. And it's in the dirt. Gets behind Hill. Will roll to the backstop. And everybody moves up 90 feet. Baylor goes on to third. And Sample moves to second. And I'll assume it's a wild pitch until we hear otherwise. Especially when I'm working with a catcher. Well, I tell you, I don't think he did a good job. It's not like Mark Hill. He just kind of reaches down. He didn't move at all on that ball. He didn't get in front of it. It did hit the dirt, and usually that's the yardstick. If it hits the dirt, it's a wild pitch, but uh, that's not like Mark. He's a good receiver. So with one out, runners at second and third. The count to Weininger is three and one. Bobby Meacham, the shortstop, is the number nine hitter on deck. Three balls, one strike. Missed inside, so that loads him up. That's two walks in the inning, three walks in the game for Lawler. And with the bases loaded, one out, one nothing Yankees in the second. Here comes Meacham. To add to everything else, the cold and the rain, Tony La Russa sees himself surrounded there's a 15 mile an hour wind which is a pitcher's wind since it is blowing in coming in towards home there's Bobby Meacham now with a chance to get rich in a hurry oh and one you just saw that shot of the flag but here in this ballpark players will check flags all over this ballpark because it can be confusing one looks like it's blown in the other one will be blown in almost completely opposite no balls and one strike to count. Fastball and the count 0 and 2. Andre Robertson was saying before the ball game that he is very close to, as he put it, taking serious workouts. 
Meacham took a serious workout before the game. The clubs were not hitting because of the uh, early start, and Meacham in batting practice was having trouble with the pitch on the outside part of the plate. Just didn't seem to be able to cover that part with his stance and the fact that he's lifting up, pulling away from it. 0-2 oh, to Bobby. Showing that bit. 1-2. and two. I think that's the target, too, Vin, at outside part of the plate because he's not striding into it, and uh, he's back from the plate. He'd like to return the favor. He was originally drafted by the Chicago White Sox, and he's up there now trying to punch a hole in Tim Lawler and the team picture. The count, one and two. Two and two. So you have Don Baylor at third, Billy Sample at second, Butch Weininger at first, the Yankee run in the first inning, Henderson walked and stole second, took third on a slow roll of the short, and scored on Mattingly's fly ball. And that's it. 1-0 New York, top of the second. Here's his pitcher decision. He's got to make it happen here. He doesn't want to go to three and two. Two balls, two strikes. Fastball, a one-hopper hit down to Cruz. He feeds B and he goes to first. Double play. And the Yankees lead two more. The thing to watch here is Ian's aggressiveness coming across that back from the shortstop side. Now, he flicks it. Look how far out of the way he is. In fact, last night, he was charged with an error because he caught a ball and wasn't on the bag. He was in the neighborhood, which is a great Dodger tradition. Their infielders were always in the neighborhood on the double play, never on the face. I beg your pardon. Okay, I just thought I would tell you that. <laughs> Last night, the Yankees left 14, and of course, Yogi sees them load the bases and leave two in the second inning. So now in the bottom of the second, it'll be Tom Pashore, known throughout his career as Wimpy. Tom hitting 250. Big, slow, breaking ball, missing ball one. Would this guy be a starter on your all nice guys team? Yeah, and one of the great smiles oh. of all time. Hard to believe he's filed up 12 years now in the big league. Time goes, two and all the count. Tom Pashorek, born in Detroit, suffered a broken hand last year. That really slowed him up, fouled it away. He was out for a month. Dennis Martinez struck him with a pitch in the first inning in June, broke the hand, and he was on the DL the next day. He had five hits in a game against Milwaukee last year, and he had a six-game hitting streak. That's terrific. I guarantee you that's terrific. Now, who cares the score? Ball four to Tom Pashore. Let's pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. You know, I was talking about the cold weather, and I certainly don't need to make excuses for Major League ball players. Lawler and Rasmussen have each walked two. We're only in the second inning. I think the combination of trying to hold on to the slick ball with slick fingers in the cold, plus sitting in the dugout for any length of time, you have to be chilled. And here's Pud, Carlton Fitz, who can handle a bat. You can put a play on with him. Ball one. He has played in 12 games this year, and Fisk has gotten at least one base hit in 10 of them. Of course, the Red Sox are just to do forget him. Every time he looks at the Red Sox, he hits a home run, it seems. So, Dennis struggling. Fisk trying to stay loose, and the count two balls and no strikes. Yeah, look at that against the Red Sox. I, every time I pick up the paper, I see where he's hit one. He spoiled opening day in Boston, and then the first time the Red Sox came here, he knocked them around. He uses the whole ballpark. He can hit the ball with good power in the right center field. He can hit behind the runner, and we certainly know he can pull the ball. That famous shot in the World Series. I'll tell you what about using the whole field. Last year, he was only the third hitter in White Sox history to hit for the cycle, and the first guy to do it here at Comiskey Park. He had a single, a double, a triple, and a home run against Kansas City here. That's using the whole ballpark. Yes, sir. Three and oh. And he's walked him. So it looks like it's gonna be one of those days. 
five walks in the game. We're only in the bottom of the second. And hold everything. Lou Pinella. Or is that Mark Connors? Mark Connors is coming up. And here comes the pitching coach. Based on balls, there's no defense against that. In fact, last night's ball game, it was the headlines that uh, went to uh, Harold Baines. But here was uh, Fletcher, hitter before him. Two balls and no strikes. Swung and missed. Three and one. And then walked him. And then Baines hits it. Baines is going to hit him. But the base on balls is what really was the, the, the pressure in that ball game. You know, it's an interesting thing about Harold Baines. He hit his fourth home run of the year last night. That's more home runs in the month of April. And he's hit in the five. Aprils, he's been in the big league. So for the first time in his career, Baines is off and running. And you know what? Yogi had just sent word out, don't give him a ball outside. Jam him. Well, let's see what Mark Hill does now. With two on, he's going to sacrifice. Coming in is Dale Barra. Flips it over to first in time, and everybody moves up. Bishorek to third. Fisk to second. The tying run is 90 feet away. And the tiebreaker out at second. And the batter will be Greg Walker. swing has been struggling a little bit particularly against left-hand pitching he struck out 10 times and the difference is last year he was hitting 320 against righties and about 170 against lefties so naturally they're pitching to him with Rasmussen on the mound strike he has struck out a little more than 15 percent of the time already and the majority of those strikeouts against left-handers. He's very deep in that batter's box. They'll try to move him off the plate, but the strike zone would be that outside part. Check swing foul into the seats off to the left of the plate. And so he is in a hole now, 0-2, oh as Rasmussen going right after him. On deck is the center fielder, Luis Salazar. You have one away, bottom of the second. The Yankees leading one to nothing. And Greg Walker up there with runners at second and third. No balls, two strikes. Foul back. That's a good shot to see how pitchers work on hitters, and you can see that even with the two-strike no-ball count, he was going right after him. You would think that he'd maybe move him back and then hit that outside corner, but he just went right for him. Greg Walker, with that sweet swing of his, also leads the White Sox in strikeouts this year, so you would expect he's going to be a little defensive now. 0-2. Oh, Let's see. Slow one, and he whacked it foul. Oh, what a bad pitch. He got it up and in with a two-strike count. That looked like a basketball to Walker, I'll bet you. I'll tell you, if he would have gotten a base hit on that, Yogi would have done cartwheels because you can't throw that pitch to where he can hit it. You just got to show him that pitch, mm. bounce it up, and throw that 55-footer. Well, that was the only reprieve. Oh, and two. I don't think Rasmussen will come back with that kind of pitch again. Fastball. Got him looking on the corner. Boy, he's... I tell you that, if he missed that 0-2 off speed, he was done. So Walker goes down as Rasmussen punches him out. Second strikeout for Dennis. And the batter now, Louis Salazar. Salazar, playing center field today, made a good throw, if you were with us. However, not good enough to get the speedy Ricky Henderson. And now La Russa's starting to think, well, am I going to start leaving people on? Yogi trying to get off the hook as he nestles down in the corner of the bench. 2-0. Oh. Ozzie Gian, the shortstop, hits ninth back of Salazar. Remember, first base open. Gian is hitting 313. Salazar is hitting 179. exactly an intentional walk but they're not about and now they're going to say put him on let's not mess around he won't chase three let's not make any mistakes so that makes it an intentional walk that means four walks given up by Rasmussen six walks in two innings today and Ian 
is a hacker, too. He doesn't go up there for the base on balls. He'll be swinging the bat. Well, Guillen has a little six-game hitting streak. And you might know if you read the story, Ed Whitson was working on a no-hitter last night in the sixth inning, and it was Guillen who broke it up with a base hit. So Ozzie Guillen, the hitter. I like the way he wears his socks, too. You can see those socks. He said those little stirrups they're wearing now, those little strings. Guillen is a contact hitter. He has only struck out three times. However, he's going up against the left-hander. Say he's a first ball swinger if he's around the plate. Big slow roundhouse jug. Ball one. One and oh. We should point out we have already played over 40 minutes. We're only in the bottom of the second. The last 11 White Sox games have averaged three hours and six minutes. Ground ball down to the right side to Randolph. And Willie flips over to Mattingly, and the Yankees are out of the jam. And the Sox leave three. At the end of two, one nothing New York, we'll be back after these messages from your local station. The rains have abated. However, it is dark and overcast. They have turned the lights on. We have that at least 15-mile-an-hour wind blowing in from left field. And for good measure, at the start of the game, it was 44 degrees. I give you all that for no other reason than to perhaps explain the fact that the pitchers are struggling. Lawler has walked two. He has committed a wild pitch. In fact, Lawler has walked three. And Rasmussen walked three in the second inning. He's walked four in the game. So seven walks in two innings. And I really think the weather has something to do with it. What about the poor catchers? Is that they're playing pitch and catch with these guys? What about the poor catcher? He's got a nice chest protector, shin guards to keep his legs warm, a thing over his face. Thank you, fungus tongue. <laughs> and in his case, a beard. <laughs> oh, all in one account. Not a way to go, Mark. Poor guy. One and one account to Kenny Henderson. Kenny's one of the, uh, Ricky Henderson, one of the few major leaguers who bats right-handed and throws left-handed. You don't usually see that. That's foul and almost took the six heels off. He and Michael just did get out of the way of it. Henderson gives you a very small strike zone because of the way he crouches, but if you watch him swing, when he swings, his head is still in that strike zone. Many times when the fellow's low, he pulls up, and you'll see him miss the ball or pop it up, but he goes right after it. One and two. Two balls, two strikes. He's won. White Sox nothing. Tim Lawler against Dennis Rasmussen. And Lawler working on Ricky Henderson. Oh, got him looking. Set him up. Punched him out. So one out in the third. One nothing New York. Talking about New York. Let's go there. All right, Vinny, at Fenway, after falling behind 2-0, Boston has come back to take the lead against Kansas City. Jackie Gutierrez triples down the right field line because Sheridan can't get there. One run scores. They have a chance to get Rich Gedman at the plate, but Frank White's throw is not there. Three runs in the bottom of the second. It is 3-2. All right, Bill, so the Royals and rolling all around the pitch outside ball one to Willie Randolph who grounded slowly to short. That was the key play because it allowed Henderson to take third and he was able to score on the fly ball by Don Mattingly and that's the difference in the game. one nothing New York here in the third. Don Mattingly on deck. He's behind 3-0. and oh. There you can see the lineup card. There's Lou Pinella sitting down. Yankee batting coach, the former great star with New York, and the tradition rolls on. 3-0 on the outside corner. He had just finished talking to Bobby Meacham about pulling away from the ball. He, his theory of Pinell is in a good one, and it's a correct one. Three balls, one strike. Missed him. So for Lawler now, his fourth walk, eight walks in two and a third inning. 
A memorable day this day in baseball. One of the greatest said goodbye. Stadium, and it is particularly poignant as we give you a Yankee White Sox game in Comiskey Park. Remember, we talked about the Yankees being instrumental in having this ballpark changed because of their popularity. And if you look to the right field area, the right field pavilion, the first man to hit a home run over the pavilion roof was none other than Babe Ruth. One ball, no strike. A little thumber out into shallow center. Trouble, it's gonna fall for a hit. And Randolph hesitates and he will keep on going. And the Yankees are in business with runners at first and third. That hurt. And shaking his hands is mattingly, but he'll take the base hit any way he can get it. Boy, he really thumbed that one. That he did, he hit it right off the handle. As you can see, him trying to pump some juice back in there. He needs a jumper cable as cold as it is today. Salazar came in, looked like he was going to take the ball on the bounce, but since Mattingly had hit it off the handle, had that crazy spin on it, spun away, and Randolph was able to take that extra base. So Mattingly not only has the only RBI with the scoring fly ball, he has now extended his hitting streak to nine, and it'll bring up big Dave Winfield, who rolled a short in the first inning. So the Yankees at first and third, leading one to nothing, one out in the third inning. Big guys had some big years already. Winfield, two home runs, half a dozen RBIs, hitting 278. Oh, one, one one and oh. Winfield, with all of his power and big swing, doesn't strike out very much, taking into consideration that he's a 100 RBI man, has hit 30 home runs many times. He has never struck out 100 times in his entire career. Line foul down the left field line, out of play. He's an aggressive hitter. He strides right into that ball, unless he guesses for a pitch inside. Really covers the plate well, even though he's a long way from it, as we looked at Randolph the third and Mattingly at first. Well, what a race last year with Mattingly and Winfield for the batting crown. Mattingly winning it at 343. Big Dave finishing up at 340. And wouldn't you know, he was also second to Mattingly in batting average on the road in the entire league. And that's a shot up the middle. A diving stop by Cruz. Over to Guillen. Double play. And as good a double play as you'll ever see. And now there's this. With a fellow who can fly down the line, Winfield, what a double play this is. Now Cruz takes the base hit away from Winfield right through the legs of Lawler. Now he gets it with the glove, knows he doesn't have enough time. Watch what he does. Gian says, I don't have enough time for the glove, barehanded. And they get him, and Winfield goes to his position talking to himself. That's one of the more outstanding double plays considering everything. Look at this. And remember, the guy going down the line can really motor. And as so often happens, the starter of a great play leads off the inning, Julio Cruz. You know, they haven't had a gold glove here in Chicago since 1981 when Mike Squires was here. They might wind up with one yet. Oh, one. It's still 1-0 Yankees. Bottom of the third inning. The Yankees have the bases loaded in the second and Meacham hit into a double play. First and third, one out in the third. And then Winfield, it's hard to say Winfield hit into a double play. Uh hard to hit a ball that hard and come hit up, it up empty. the middle and come up with nothing. One ball and one strike to Julio Cruz. That's on the corner, one and two. For 
Arroyo, he made his Major League debut against the White Sox. That was when he was with Seattle back in 77. They call him Juice around here. And he was born in Brooklyn. Cruz followed by Fletcher and then Bain. One nothing Yankees. Oh, got him. Kept the ball away. Cruz didn't have much of a swing. That'll be the third strikeout for Dennis Rasmussen. And it'll bring up Scott Fletcher. See Rasmussen may be alive looking for the bunt. Dale has moved in. Dale Bear has moved in close to third base. Look at that cutout at third base. That's a little wider than normal. It's an 18-foot cutout. They say that you should have a 13 feet, but here they give them more because feel that the infielders don't like to look at the lip of the grass and like to feel it off the dirt part as possible. And the bosses accommodate. Ball one to Scott Fletcher. You know, we were talking before about Yogi Berra. You can look at Scott Fletcher. We think Berra is much a part of New York as the Empire State Building. Fletcher is a great deal part of the city of Chicago, even though he's just a kid, 26 years old, because he's one of the few people to play for both the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox, and nobody else. So when he says, my kind of town, he's got the right. Isn't he the kid didn't want to drive you out to the ballpark in Milwaukee? Was that him? Remember, you thought it was the driver? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> He's got such a baby face, I died of embarrassment. <laughs> Two and one. We were at the, we were at the hotel in, in Milwaukee, and usually there's somebody who will take Joe and me to the ballpark before the game, and here is this young kid standing by the door, and I just said to him, are you the driver to take us to the park? And then this big grin came on his face. No, sir, he said, I'm a player. And you know what? He is. And Scotty chases one, and down he goes. So Rasmussen has now had back-to-back -back strikeouts. That gives him four in the game. And with two out on the third, here comes Mr. Bain. And for the Yankees, the bane of their existence. He hit 429 and five home runs last year. He said hello to the Yankees by hitting the big one last night with two men aboard. Slow curveball for a strike. 0 and 1 to Harold. Start to get that pitch over. He's really going to be tough because it's fastball. No doubt about that being alive. One ball and one strike to Harold. Boy, with Mattingly at 24 and Baines at 26. We have some great young left-handed talent going to be around a while. people were looking at with their hearts. It was just an ordinary fly ball. And into a 15-mile-an-hour win. At the end of three, Yankees won, White Sox nothing. I would like to take this opportunity to be the first to wish you a very Merry Christmas for 1985. Happy, happy New Year. Yes. Yeah. Was that a double play? Did you ever see anything any better than ne that? Never any better. Yeah. Hit a ball that hard. And to be able to, to backhand the ball, flip it out of your glove, have the other guy catch it in the perfect spot, and then double up a fellow who runs like Winfield, it's really the big league. Well, and the kid Gian, you know, he's playing like a 10-year vet. Here it is again. Now watch what happens here. The glove down, flips it to him, barehanded, knows he can't make the play any other way. Well, that's not only the play of the day. That one, that one should be put aside and kept for people to look at because it was a masterpiece is what it was. Meanwhile, we go along into the fourth inning. Hope you're enjoying yourself wherever you are. It is one to nothing Yankees, and despite the inclement weather, well, we have ourselves a dandy here. Here's Don Baylor, followed by Billy Sample, and then Dale Barra. Change, a hot one at third. Scott Fletcher stays with it and gets him. And that's the only hot thing about Chicago today. That was a tough play. It was a hard hit ball. Came off that grass, kind of a half bad hop. And watch him just stay right with it. I think he's not so sure he's got it. Now he's going to check it again and say, there it is. I got you now. Good play. Do you remember when the Yankees opened up in Boston and lost two games and George Steinbrenner was quoted as saying, I'm embarrassed. And you know how newspapers take quote of the day. 
the Boston Herald had the quote of the day, George Steinbrenner saying, I'm embarrassed. And one of the Yankee players said, quote of the day, you mean the president or the pope didn't say anything better than I'm embarrassed? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a long-range needle. 0-1 oh to Billy Sample. Foul back. 0-2. Oh I can't believe that the second game or third game of the season, this is a crucial series, and every day it's on the line. I tell you, Yogi is different. It's affecting him. You know what? I saw him smoking. Does that mean he's back to smoking oh, again? Oh, he's back to smoking. He's chewing. Mm. And you know what? That takes care of Sample. He doesn't say anything, but you know guys in the old neighborhood that they can say one thing and then you know you're reading them he's hurting he's hurting inside and he feels badly for the players because of the turmoil that's going on yeah. he doesn't need it so with two down in the fourth inning here's dale barra you know you talk about pressure this is another situation you're the manager and you got your boy i bet he's hard on his boy harder perhaps on his own son than he would be on anybody else and that would be natural he leans the other way want to know the count one and one i have a theory you want to hear it yeah george steinbrenner has a horse in the kentucky derby okay and he's got his two sports his entities mixed up the horse is supposed to go wire to wire in first place no team one hopper look at cruz he's at it and the juice squeezes the Yankees once more. And at the end of three and a half innings, somehow it's still only Yankees one, White Sox nothing. Here's Julio Cruz, some more magic. What can you say? He's got a magnet in that glove. Now we go to the bottom of the fourth inning. It is still one to nothing in favor of the Yankees. Tom Bishorek followed by Carlton Fisk and then Mark Hill. The only run, if you weren't with us, in the first inning, Ricky Henderson walked and stole second. He took third as Randolph rolled slowly to short and Henderson scored on Mattingly's fly ball to center. And that's it. And Henderson barely did get in on a strong throw by Louis Salazar. Each team getting men aboard. Each man struggling, however, to move them around. And the White Sox have out-defensed the Yankees with as good a double play as you would ever see when Winfield came up in the third inning. So now it's Fischorek who walked in the second. Fastball strike. Four and one. Wimpy got the third, and they left him there. You know, when Tim Waller was at the University of Arkansas, he was an All-American hitter, and he has eight home runs in his big league career. Well, I think that uh, Mr. Uberoff is going to take care of that this year. He's going to get uh, all of us good hitting pitchers back in the lineup. So Tim coming over from the National League where they allowed him to swing the bat. Now in the American League where he can't. And he's hoping that the D.H. vote will go his way. High foul out of play by Carlton Fisk. Last week, of course, you remember, our poll was definitely against the D.H. rule. However, it was a National League game. Now, we'll have to do it with American League teams involved to really make it an authentic, thoroughly researched phone call review. the throw down not in time and I'm surprised that this missed the ball because he is a good handler of that bat and they can put a play on and he's a bit disgusted with himself although Pichard beats the throw and ends up with a stolen base so Pichard the tying run at second base nobody out on the fourth inning one nothing New York and Carlin Fisk trying to nudge him around he did not do too much nudging last year. With people in scoring position, Carlton had some trouble. Low curve fouled away. Last year, Carlton Fisk had a total of 43 RBIs, but he hit less than 200, there it is, with runners in scoring position. 
could also be they just didn't want to give him anything to hit, too. Here's a place where they say, well, he should hit to the right side. Uh, if you're my DH and you're batting fifth and it's only the fourth inning, you're losing by a run, swing. One and two to count. Seventh, eighth, and ninth inning, yes, hit the ground ball to the second baseman. But now, I don't need an out. Hack Not away. Runs. Whack it. One and two the count to Carlton Fisk. We're in the fourth, one nothing Yankee. On a walk, stolen base by Henderson. Mattingly fly ball picked him up. Two and two. Fisk is six home runs shy of fourth place on home runs by catchers. What makes it interesting is the fellow who is just ahead of him, one of the great names in Chicago history, Gabby Hartman. High pop fly on the left side, and it's Dale Barra. And that 15 mile an hour breeze kind of nudged that towards the plate. So Fisk fouls out. That was not an easy play because of that wind, Ben. Right. So Fisk, unable to advance a man, and now you have Mark Hill and Greg Walker trying to pick him up. And remember, Walker struck out against Rasmus. Hill is hitting only 167. So, of course, LaRusso is hoping to at least get Pashorek to third. He got a good pitch to hit. Let her high fastball. The key to this lineup is the fact that Kittle cannot play. Kittle can pinch hit, but the Tony had a tough time making out this lineup. Right, Kittle ran into the wall, hurt his shoulder, can't throw, can't play, but he can swing. We might see him later. So he gave him a, the location on that pitch was great. It was the same fastball, but instead of being letter high in, Mark was looking for another one inside. He was giving, so he had a half a swing. He got cheated that time. He outguessed himself. 0 oh, and 2 to Mark Hill. If you have a name of Hill, and there's Pashorek at second, what do you think a nickname would be? Uh, well, yeah, an idea. But in Western lore, they talk about Boot Hill, right? So they call him Booter. Good thing he's not an infielder. Low curve. And he rolled it to the right side. And Randolph takes care of Hill. Say, we'd like to remind you once again, we'll be selecting the NBC Light Beer from Miller player of the game at the conclusion of this ball game. I'm going to second guess that pitch. If I were out just there, gonna say I it. think I'd have to go to him and say, hey, look, if you're going to throw that lollipop, you just show it to him because if they get a hit, I'm going to come out there and choke you. Well, look at the lollipop he threw Walker Owen to. Right. Same pitch. Because he's got a good uh, fastball going and spotting it well. His big breaking curveball, a hard one, is in a good spot. And then he throws his big lollipop is what it is. Well, let's see what Walker can do now. On the outside corner. Remember, he had him two quick strikes. Then threw that big, slow rainbow. And Walker ripped it foul. And then he punched him out with a fastball. So let's see how he works in this time with a runner at third and two out. one nothing Yankees, bottom of the fourth. You can see the uh, late Charlie Lau's influence on Walker with the weight on the back foot and the toe up. And it was Lau who said Kittle would hit home, will hit a lot of home runs, but Walker will be a good hitter. One ball, one strike to Greg. High fly ball, but it comes too late. It comes with two out. And Billy Sample will put it away. And the Sox lead the tying run at third. one nothing New York at the end of four. We'll be back after these messages from your local station. one to nothing in favor of the Yankees as we go to the fifth inning in a battle between Tim Lawler of the Chicago White Sox and Dennis Rasmussen. Keeping track of lineups and any maneuvering so far, there's not been any necessity to do that. Tony, of course, is an attorney. So when he looks down, I guess you could say he's studying a legal brief. He's a licensed attorney in Florida. Speaks Spanish fluently. That should come in handy. And interestingly enough, 
He's only the fifth lawyer manager in Major League history, and the other four are in the Hall of Fame. And here's Butch Weiniger. Walked in the second inning. Right. If you want the four, Montgomery Ward, Huey Jennings, Miller Huggins, and Branch Rickey. One ball, one strike. And of course, this great affection and love and friendship with Al Lopez help him another Hall of Famer. One and one to Butch, then you get Bobby Meacham, and then Ricky Henderson. Last ball away. Two and one. One run, two hits for the Yankees. One run, uh, no runs, one hit for the White Sox, a single by Pashore. Out away. Two and two. The White Sox back of Lawler, Walker, Cruz, Guillen, and Fletcher. Bashorek, Salazar, and Baines, and that's Mark Hill behind the plate. Two and two to Butch Weiniger. One nothing Yankees, top of the fifth. The Yankees start the day three games back of Baltimore. The White Sox begin the day a game and a half back of California. of Ricky Henderson. That's the difference in the game. Walk, stolen base, and eventually scored on a fly ball. Barely. Fastball. A little late, fouled it away. You mentioned Henderson. It's going to be interesting to see the effect you'll have on Willie Randolph, because Randolph can handle a bat by his natural instincts, hits the ball to the right side. That's going to be a powerful one-two combination going for the Yankees. Big chopper to third. Over the head of Fletcher. Makes a great stop. Got him. Another dazzler. Watch him go up the ladder. Almost outruns that ball. Now what's he going to do with it? He takes two steps into the outfield. He does a complete turnaround and in time to get Weininger. some weather out there today. Woo. Bobby Meacham, the hitter. You know one of my favorite newspaper sports writing stories involved the writer? This is a true story. A writer who came to the ballpark late and asked another writer to fill him in. You know, give him the out so he yeah. could write it in his scorebook. And the other writer said to the late arrival, 5-3, star that play. It was a great play. And the late arrival writer said, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> well, you can be the judge of that. was a good play by Scott Fletcher. I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> Didn't even see it, though. Well, we should. That's Al Clark, the umpire third. Only fair to put the spotlight by the men in blue. Mike Riley is behind the plate. Drew Coble is at first. Don Denkinger is on the grass out in center field. And Al Clark at third. Was talking to Meacham, uh, we pointed out earlier, because Meacham is down low, but he is pulling up on the ball when he starts to swing, pulling away, and he's back on his heels, not driving into it, and that's been part of his problem. He's the best ad in town for home cooking, is Bobby Meacham. Because he hit over 300 at Yankee Stadium and less than 200 on the road. He's a good player. You talk about range and good hands. Bobby Meacham. Three and one. One nothing Yanks, top of the fifth. And he lost him, so another walk. And we'll take a walk from Chicago to the Big Apple in New York. All right, Vinny, no score between the Mets and the Pirates at Shea until the bottom of the fourth when the Mets got two. Bases loaded, Danny Heap with a single to right. That drives home Keith Hernandez. Gary Carter will beat the throw to the plate, so it's 2 nothing Mets who are 6-0 and at Shea. Back to Chile, Chicago. Okay, Bill, and I assume from the morning papers that the newest addition to the New York Mets is left-handed Joe Sambito. Good. Here's Ricky Henderson. Walked and scored the only run and struck out. And he has Meacham at first with one out, and Bobby's got a big jump. And there's a drive to right. Vane's going back, a way back at the wall. It's gone. Home run, Henderson, 3-0 Yankees. 
You better be careful they don't pass each other. Meacham almost started back because it was faked on the pop fly. And now Henderson very carefully is watching what, what Meacham is doing so they don't pass each other. Enjoy it. So Henderson is a one-man gang. Well, take a look at Meacham. Watch him go. He had a big jump. He gets faked out of it now. He sees the ball for a while, and all of a sudden, he doesn't know what... Whoops! And down he goes. Almost hurts himself. Starts Look at the fake back. by Cruz. Yeah. He's going to throw oh, to yeah. first. He faked him. Academy Award. He had him making u turn It's a good thing that's in the seats as far as Meacham is concerned. It looked like he would need a travel bureau to find direction. So it is three to nothing. Ricky Henderson. He has walked and scored a run and knocked in the other two. 2-0 two to Willie Randolph. Randolph is grounded out and more. Got to third, and that was in the third inning when the White Sox came up with a marvelous double play. Cruz, Guillen, making magic around second base. 2-0, the count to Randolph, 3-0. The Yankees getting the maximum out of the minimum. Three runs, three hits. I never believed in cheap home runs or cheap hits. I mean, that to me is a term that should never be used. That wind blown the way it is, Ricky Henderson really had to hit that ball a long way. And how? It, they told us the wind was 15 miles an hour blowing in. It might be gusting more than that. Two and one to Willie Randolph. And that's driven to left field, hooking in the corner, down in the corner and it's against the wall by the time for will get it in standing at second is Willie Randolph and that was kissed the wind might actually have cut the trajectory without the wind he might have reached the seat instead we're seeing Dan Spilner who was at one time in his career in San Diego with Waller now throwing in the pen I think Willie thought he had himself a home run as we look at manager Tony La Russa, The sound was the home run sound, I'll tell you, but the wind, as you can see the flag, that's in the left field, and it was blown in, blown in hard. So it definitely worked against that ball hit by Willie. See the cutouts there? They're like huge windows. That's what cut that thing down to a double, I believe. The wind was coming right through those holes. And here's Mattingly. He's hit in nine straight. He picked up the RBI in the first inning, extended his streak with a single in the third inning. Now, remember we pointed out before Carlton Fisk had trouble with runners in scoring position. Mattingly hit over 400 with runners in scoring position last year. In fact, he led the American League in that situation. He hits one to center, but Salazar will make the catch, and holding at second base is Randolph. That's the second out. And imagine what kind of an inning this might have been had it not been a great play by Scott Fletcher at third on Weiniger's ball. Here's an interesting situation that shows you how managers think. Now, before the game, I said, which, uh, which player on the Yankees don't want you to beat him? And here comes LaRusse out of the dugout. I said, would it be Winfield? And LaRusse thought about it, thought about it. And he said, no, Baylor. So you got first base open. You could put Winfield on, but if it came down to a game situation, he'd rather pitch to Winfield than he would to Baylor. So Dan Spilner is coming out of the White Sox bullpen to pick up for Tom Lawler. And the Yankees are leading 3-0 and looking for more. Don't forget the legends of golf coming up next from Austin, Texas. Charlie Jones, Lee Trevino. John Brody and all the gang. Now, here's the leaderboard at the end of two. You can see Casper and Brewer, Billy Casper and Gabe Brewer at 13 under. Roberto DiVicenzo and Kenny still at 13 under. So, Kenny is playing very well. Bart Wall, Doug Sanders at 11 under. And Miller Barber and Bob Goldby at 11 under. So, Goldby's not working with the microphone. He's out there hacking away and doing well. So, it's all coming up right after the game. They're playing well. That's still playing well. I saw him on Sun City in the uh, seniors. So it's it's really great to have him out there. Well, here's Winfield against Dan Spilner. Spilner is a 33-year-old right-hander, and Dave Winfield can age you in a hurry. Spilner came here from Cleveland, won one game. 
He beat Minnesota for his only victory as a White Sox pitcher. That's a strike. One and one. Dan was a hard luck pitcher in the sense that his season came to an end the middle of September. He slipped on the mound in Anaheim Stadium, delivered a pitch, pulled a muscle in the rib cage, and he was finished for the year. Originally signed by the Padres back in 1970. And from Casper, Wyoming. And there's a high drive into left field. Kishorek, however, with the wind cutting it down, will come in for it, and that's the end of it. However, the Yankees get a home run and a double, add two. And at the end of four and a half, Yankees three, White Sox nothing. As you can see, bottom of the fifth inning, the Yankees leading three nothing. Tim Lawler is gone. Lawler went four and two third innings and allowed three runs and four hits. But what is interesting, and we're sure not picking on him, because complete games like the Buffalo are starting to vanish. And yet, with Lawler, it's rather remarkable. Tim Lawler has made 111 career starts. 111. You know how many of those he finished? Ocho, eight. Eight out of 111. So it's heartbreaking for him. Wait his turn and not be around very long. And Luis Salazar oh. fouls it away, and he's got a hot foot. He got that on the left one. Oh, when your feet are cold. When your feet are cold. Ah, oh, there goes the dance. All the all the tickets for the, the whole book. You turn it in. Mm. <laughs> he's not ready. No. was walked intentionally in the second inning. They fell behind 3-0 and and decided to take the bat away from him. One ball and one strike to count. So Dennis Rasmussen leading 3-0 in the fifth. Six foot seven inch left hand. I'd like to see him jump ball against Mike Smithson, who is 6'8". Big slow change and he's high with it. Two and one. shallow right Randolph backing up coming in his Winfield but Willie will take care of it there has been another great shortstop from Venezuela here in Chicago yep there he is he came a long way from Venezuela to become an integral part of this city Luis Aparicio now a member of the Hall of Fame and now another youngster picking up the torch to play shortstop and from Venezuela. Ozzy Guillen, a bunt. Short hop by Berra, and Dale makes a good play. Looked like he was having trouble getting the ball out of the glove. He anticipated the play, anticipated the play well because he was in very shallow, and he's got it in the webbing. He had to do a double take to get that ball out of there, but he makes a good play on it. Again, was that he got it so far to the infield side, he had to get it close to the line. Meanwhile, with all the fuss and the feathers here, the White Sox have only one hit. A clean single to left by Tom Pashorek in the fourth inning. So Rasmussen pitching a dandy as he works on Julio Cruz. Talking about dandy, Cruz has made two outstanding plays at second base. He's got to really be tough to, to hit right about now for a lot of reasons, uh, at least with the mound. He's six foot seven and then high mound. Ball two, two and one. Yeah, like the Colossus of Rhodes standing up on top looking down at Cruz. You know, Julio's made two great plays. It makes you think the last second baseman in Chicago for the White Sox to get a gold glove was Nellie Fox, and it wasn't exactly yesterday afternoon. Nelly picked up his glove 25 years ago here. And maybe Julio will get a shot. Although how you can beat out people like Frank White, who can just, well, it's just pretty tough. The Mets are leading 2-0 over the Bucks in the sixth inning. And by the way, some of the best news I've heard in a long time. Bob Prince is coming back to do the pirate broadcast hey, in Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's right. Boy, I couldn't be happier. The gunner will return. It'll be old time. Oh, boy. Bob underwent some surgery recently, and I'm 
sure if he's anywhere near a television set. He's looking at a ball game. And we want to send him our best, and I can't wait. Welcome him back. We'll pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. This is WOC-TV in Davenport, your station for the best in sports. Chicago and see the Padres and the Cubs. Bob and Tony will handle the Mets and the Reds. Meanwhile, we go to the sixth. Don Baylor takes ball one. Don't forget, not that you need me to remind you. Okay, that's well done. When you go to bed tonight, move that clock up an hour, spring forward and fall back so we lose an hour tonight. single to right and then lost a hit on a fine play by Scott Fletcher in the fourth inning and Fletcher playing him back near the line Baylor with the count three and oh got the inside corner three and one remember we told you that he gets hit a lot he was hit 23 times last year, 170 in his career because he's right on the plate. And he hangs it to center, and Louis Salazar will put that in the ball bag. One away. Benny Minoso, who played here, holds the American League record for being hit by pitches, 189, and Ron Hunt. Old black and blue lumpy Hunt, we call it. <laughs> he holds the all-time record. When you hit over 200 times, those nicknames apply. And here's Billy Sample. Walked and struck out 0 for 1. Can you imagine a guy practicing that, though? Oh, no. I can hear Casey saying to him now, go up and take one for the club. <laughs> <laughs> one ball and no strike. Meanwhile, all wrapped up trying to stay warm, Dennis Rasmussen. One ball, one strike. Might add that the dugouts do have heat 
and the panel above the dugout. There was one club, though, that the manager said, we'll have the heat. Those guys get nothing over there. Hey, you know what? I heard another true Yogi Berra story, and you didn't tell it to me. I heard it today. All right. Lauren Brown, who does the games here for the Sox, off-speed high ball, too. They were talking about when they're on the road and they wake up in the middle of the night thirsty, they always keep a glass of water by the bed. And Yogi said, I always like to keep ice water by the bed. But he said, when I come to Chicago, I don't have to get ice because it's so cold here, the water in the hotel is cold. And Lauren said, that's swell, Yogi. Thanks. <laughs> three, three and one. <laughs> and that's a strike. count the Billy Sample. Did you hear that Mickey Rivers line? I think they're going to write a book on Mickey. Oh, they have to. One-liners. Quotations from Chairman Rivers. Yeah. Little bouncer over the glove of Spillner, but he in there to handle it. We'll give you Mickey Rivers, but first we're going to go across the rivers to New York. <laughs> Vinny, not far from you in Milwaukee after the Brewers have scored a run. Detroit gets on the board. Alex Sanchez triples to right. Doug Loman makes a fine effort, but he can't get there to make the catch. So Chet Lemon comes home. It is a triple for Sanchez. Bottom of the second. They are tied all at 1-1. One, one. Okay. With two down here in the sixth inning, three nothing Yankees. Mickey Rivers said this guy was so ugly when you walked by him it made your clothes wrinkle. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's terrible. He had a ton of them though. One ball and one strike to Barra. Late, jammed, fouled it away. It's still three nothing Yankees. Top of the sixth. The White Sox have only had two hits. What he was going to do is score 100 runs, drive in 100 runs, and stay injury prone? Stay injury prone. One and two. Slow roller down to Julio Cruz, and the juice takes care of Barra. For somebody to go in order, it usually takes tough plays, but not that inning. The end of five and a half, three nothing Yankees. My dear friend, can I tell you something? Yes. You look like you should be on the steps outside of a cathedral wearing sackcloth and ashes for some <laughs> terrible thing. <laughs> no, I, sh I should be back in Arizona is where I should be. <laughs> Audrey, you can see what a sweet, lovable guy. No ego. He just wants to stay warm and keep his head warm. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> you really need it today when you don't have that grass on the infield. <laughs> Now, those two. now, there's a way to bundle up, and I got you. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about going bad? <laughs> there we go to the bottom of the six with Tom Peshore, Carlton Fisk, and Mark Hill. Three to nothing Yankees. Three runs, four hits. The Sox just two hits, a Peshore single and a Scott Fletcher single. Rasmussen has allowed two hits. Walk five, struck out four, and the Sox have left six men through five innings. Of course, the big look at the game the Sox had was in the fifth. The tying run of the plate was Harold Baines, and as Joe said, he's a first ball hitter. Sure enough, he hit the first ball in the air to Henderson, and that was that. Two and all to Peshore. out of third and Bashorek chipped the bat I believe he's checking it and it's okay he was examining the handle two and two ground foul again back of Jim Leyland coaching at third the game ready to pop up there coming down the wire I believe there it is Minnesota leading Oakland 3-0 in the third inning two balls two strikes a drive to right Winfield going back he's there so for sure it goes the other way and comes up empty one down and the battle will be called in fifth 
You know, last year for the Yankees, as Fisk comes up, Dennis Rasmussen made 24 starts and completed one. So you can bet they'll be keeping an eye on him here as he has gotten himself into the bottom of the six with one out. Fisk walked and fouled out. The foul out in the fourth inning was a pivotal play because he came up with a runner at second and nobody out failed to advance him. And the following out could not produce a run. You want to talk about a great athlete? Here's a guy when he was a kid in high school. He was MVP in baseball, basketball, and soccer in New Hampshire. This was spring training when Carlin was, uh, I guess you'd say he popped off because he stepped out of his role as a player and said Ozzie Guillen wasn't ready to play shortstop. That got him into some hot water, which it he sure could did. use today. <laughs> Two and one. One out, sixth inning, three nothing Yankees. High pop fly and foul ground comes Mattingly over near the Yankee dugout but a lot of room. You know, talking about complete games, though, Ben, when you said that, just thinking about it, the bullpen has really become high rent district now. It oh. used to be the place you pitch yourself back into rotation, but I think a lot of decisions are based on the fact that they got those guys who can close it down. Every bullpen in the American League must have a life-size autograph picture of Dan Quisenberry. I mean, what is he getting? Forty million dollars for Lifetime. the next two thousand years, right? And all the land west of the Mississippi. Strike to Mark Hill. This telecast presented by Authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. That's fouled away. You know what? And I'm deadly serious now. I'm talking about a picture of a player. I swear, if I were the commissioner of baseball, I would get a large picture of Denny McLean, and I would have it on the wall of every clubhouse and organized baseball so that kids can look and understand the tragedy and what wow. can happen to a human being in such a short time. What was it Denny said? I could have cried when I read it. He said, I can't believe I've come, I came, this far. I've come so far to where I am today mm -hmm. in such a short time. Up the middle. Flagged it short. And Look at that him. But remember, it was Mark Hill. And I'm saying that not to take anything away from Bobby Meacham, but he was not exactly throwing out Jesse Owens. We'll be back after these messages. Here's that play again, but the key to this is watch how aggressively he turns and just fires that ball. Bobby meets him. He had no doubt he was going to throw the first base. It's true Mark Hill is not in the picture, but you have to point out, not only is he a catcher, but they built a hill between home plate and... <laughs> Shot to the right side, and Cruz is there to pick it, and that'll do it to Butch Weiniger. One away. Here's the way he grabs that ball and it makes a complete turn and he's ready to fire. Good play. The one down. You know, Mark Twain once said, everybody talks about the weather and nobody does anything about it. Well, of course, as you know, sports has tried with Dome Stadium at ball one. Today, April the 27th, 1985, I doubt if you're aware of it, I know I wasn't, but they sent it along to us, that we have not had a rain out in either the National or the American League yet, and it's the 27th of April. So then somebody said, wow, I wonder what's the longest time the major leagues had gone without a rain out, and they started going back. And it was in 1960, when they didn't get a rain out until April 26th. So I don't know whether it's the El Nino current that has changed the weather or what, but on the 27th of April, the majors have not had a rain out yet. It's interesting. I mean, I can't wait to get to the cocktail party and lay that one on them. I don't write this stuff. <laughs> Two and one to Cal. Foul ball off third. Scott Fletcher makes the play. But you know, we're always saying, you know, the weather's changed. It's those satellites up there, or it's for this, or it's for that. 
The weather actually evidently has been pretty good, plus the dome stadiums have helped, too. <laughs> yeah, and so did that to try and keep your legs warm. Who is that? That's Dale Bear there. That's Andre Robertson. He is close. You know what he was doing here in the ballpark? He was running backwards. And he, he said, I'm still a little wobbly. He said, but when I can get that back, I know I'm almost ready. Well, here's Ricky Henderson, who's ready. He has walked and scored a run, struck out, and homered with a man aboard. Well, he's done it all for the, the three. Would he be our most valuable player? Well, I tell you, I'm always inclined to go with the pitcher. I figure the pitcher works harder, and so far, a two-hit shutout's an awful lot for me. We'll have to vote. Yeah. Two and one to count. Little bit early on a fastball. He hit it off the end of the bat. That's Tom Seaver. And of course, last night was a milestone corner. There's an interesting note to remember, too. Somebody dug that out. Seaver winning number 290. No pitcher who ever won 290 games failed to win 300. You can take that to the cocktail party. Oh. In your hat, you can take it. Three and two. <laughs> Check swing, little looper, and of course, Ricky Kinmotor, Cruz, got him. And they're gone in order. That's eight in a row retired by Sox pitching at the end of six and a half, three nothing Yankees. Here's another edition of Baseball Remembers. You can see Dennis Rasmussen's numbers. Not quite half and half, but it does reflect the fact that he's battling the strike zone. He has walked five and struck out four. And he has made 95 pitches through six innings. That's fine. Better than that, he has allowed only two hits. A single to Scott Fletcher and a single to Tom Fishore. So Dennis Rasmussen with one complete game in 24 starts last year. Knowing, of course, if he falters, Dave Rigetti is down there at the pen, among others. Greg Walker hitting 258. He has two home runs, nine RBIs. The Yankees with Mattingly, Randolph, Meacham, and Barrett, Sample, Henderson, and Winfield, Weiniger behind the plate. 0 oh 2. out for the second time and of course that's really hurting him leading the club in strikeouts he has struck out 12 times so that's almost 20 percent of the time the batter Luis Salazar Salazar walked intentionally and popped up he's 0 for 1 themselves. Remember they had a great 83 and they had a humiliating 84. Only four teams in the big leagues lost more and you can see rags as they call them. Dave Rigetti heating up. Big chopper over the mound charging Meacham and it goes under his glove because it didn't come up. Bobby was hoping that ball would take the bounce and come up and it hugged the ground and Salazar is aboard. That's a do or die play. He thought he'd get the short hop, and I think we'll get a good look at it. Meacham is charging it now, hoping to get the short hop, and she just stays down and goes right through the wicket. Now he's telling the pitcher, I'll be covered in case the ball is hit back to you. They have not, a 
officially flashed it on the scoreboard, but we would assume it's an error. Salazar is at first, and here's Ozzie Guillen. Right. The White Sox felt coming in they needed relief, a third baseman, a shortstop, and an outfielder. Well, they got Gwynn to play short, Salazar to play third, Bob James to be the relief man. By the way, we get a report there was an error on that ball that went through Meacham. There's another one off the glove of Regretti, deflected to Meacham, no play! So Rasmussen got his glove on the ball and deflected it. Meacham could not make the play, and we're getting closer and closer to seeing Regretti if the Sox can get off the floor. That'll go as a base hit, and it extends Guillen now to seven. So two on, one out, and Julio Cruz will be the hitter. You have to try to come up with everything hit back to you, but that time it worked against Rasmussen because he just deflected enough, slowed it down enough to where Meacham just could not make a play. So for the second time in the last four innings, the Sox have the tying run at the plate. They have Salazar at second, Guillen at first, and Julio Cruz walked twice and struck out. Ball one. Willie Randolph shading up the middle, and with Mattingly behind the runner at first, they open up the right side of the infield, so Winfield shortens up in right field. Pitching him away. One and one on the corner. Three nothing Yankees. We're in the bottom of the seventh inning. One out. After Cruz comes Fletcher, but of course, if you're the manager, you're thinking of Baines. On that corner again. He's also got Kittle on that bench. That's right. He can swing the bat. He can't do anything else. So La Russa is hoping to play his cards and get his, his aces in this game. One and two. One out, two on. Three nothing Yankees, seventh inning. He's living outside, and he's even it up two and two. Now, if you're the hitter, do you think to yourself, he's out there, that's he's sending me messages, or are you expecting maybe he's going to come in and jam it? Well, he's, his fastball is enough. I'd say he's going to stay outside. Fly ball in the right center. Henderson and Winfield. It'll be Ricky for the catch and the runners hold as Cruz fails to advance him. You notice something too with Ricky Henderson. He's a bit of a rarity as that he catches the ball with two hands. Most of them catch one hand, and the center fielder, uh, oddly enough, they advocate catching one hand when you're running uh, to right center or to left center. Now, a ball like that is okay, two hands. You see, Ricky is checking that sun. It's a Lights are on, but there's a glare out here, and this is the time to be checking. In fact, Winfield is coming in. He wants the glasses. Naturally, looking for rose-colored <laughs> this time of year. One of the great one-liners of all time, and for fear of being in a time warp, Yogi's going out to talk to his pitcher. Dusty Rhodes came in after missing a couple fly balls. They had the glass case for him. He wanted the glass. He said, no, give me a helmet. I don't want to get hurt. He went out there with a helmet on. Well, Yogi doesn't have a helmet on, but he is going to counsel his left-hander at least. Now, Rasmussen has gone over the 100 pitch mark, which is certainly not a lot of pitches. But what you worry about is cool weather and whether you're having any trouble, whether you tighten up. And evidently, he has assured Yogi that he is okay. 3 nothing Yanks. I'm sure Yogi's great experience as a catcher, the answer that he got and the way he said it is what kept him in the ball game. Mattingly has come off the field. Randolph is coming off, so as Rigetti continues to throw bare-armed in the bullpen, they are bringing sunglasses out. So it's one of those days in Chicago. It was 44 and windy, then rainy. The lights were on, and now suddenly, late in the game, Sunglasses are needed, but it is still cold and windy, and the lights remain on. So two on, two out. The inning should be over, except for the boot by Bobby Meacham. And here is Scott Fletcher, who was an excellent hitter last year with men in scoring position. He hit 360. Of course, he gets some awfully good pitches to hit with Baines hitting back of him. How back? 
the one constant that applies to both the White Sox and the Yankees is the fact that the number three hitter day in and day out night in and night out is Don Mattingly for the Yankees and Harold Baines for the White Sox so if you're Scott Fletcher you're going to get a lot of good pitches oh and one one ball one strike but how baseball has changed he's got to get on base to get Baines up there yet the first pitch that came in or he went walking at it yeah well in a similar spot in the fifth inning he hacked and lined a base hit to left field and Harold had a shot and flied out one and one fastball and he lines it to right Winfield's going to have to play it on a hop they are sending Salazar to the plate to score down to third goes Guillen and here comes Harold again And we're within a few seconds of seeing Dave Brigetti. So I'll tell you one thing, Scott Fletcher, in that ideal situation, you know you're going to get good pitches to hit, and he has been able to capitalize it, and he chases Rasmussen. And so we'll wait for Brigetti, and this thing is a long way from being decided. We'll be right back. Well, we get down to fundamentals now. You get a fireball and left-hander Dave Rigetti and a power hitter Harold Bain. Those are Rigetti's numbers at ERA of less than a run. And he's had a hand in all six Yankee victories. Dave has five saves and a win. He's one and one. And he goes head-to-head -head with Harold Bain. It is three to one in favor of the Yankees. Fletcher is at first. Guillen is at third. And we have two out. One. As Joe pointed out, Baines, a notorious first ball hitter. Here's the spot with the time runs on base that you go with your pitcher's strength. You got to worry about him rather than the hitter. Go with your pitcher's strength. Harold hitting 311. Good save. Weiniger saved a run just then. And you know, it's amazing to me a catcher never gets an ovation. A center fielder, an infielder makes a great play. A catcher saves a run with a great block, and nobody says anything. My missionary work is paying off. It's working on me. One and one. On the corner. Oh, a mean pitch. Down and out. Scott Fletcher doing a little cheerleading at first. Ozzie Guillen walking down the line at third. They're the tying runs with two out in the seventh. The Yankees three, White Sox one. Rigetti trying to pick up the pieces and hold it for Dennis Rasmussen. One and two. And a block, and there's another. Not so much saving a run, but it could have allowed Fletcher to take the tying run into scoring position. He's a good low ball catcher. Now watch him just get in front of that ball is what he does. He blocks it going down, hit his knee. But he was there. He got the body there. He did not get the glove on it, but he got the body there, and that's what you're supposed to do. Keep that ball from getting by you. So Weiniger has come up with two big plays here in a big spot. Two and two. Look at that. In the dirt again. That's three great. Listen, Rigetti might get a save. He's got to get at least a block. <laughs> that's three big plays he's made. And that gives a pitcher confidence to just throw whatever he wants to throw wherever he wants to throw it. Not that he's trying to bounce it up there, but sometimes he's trying to overthrow it. I think the last one he did because two and two was his pitcher's decision. Now the edge has swung a little bit towards Baines, and of course, with the two outs, Fletcher will be able to run off first. And Mattingly has a little bit of room to maneuver now that he's off the bag. Three and two. Runner goes, big chopper to Mattingly, and Harold can't do it. Well, they used to let George do it. Harold can't, so they get one run, two hits, and an error, and lead two. And at the end of seven, the Yankees three, the White Sox one. We're going to the eighth inning. The Yankees three, the White Sox one, and Willie Randolph to start it off. High ball one, one and all. Randolph, Mattingly, and Winfield as the Yankees pulled out of a jam in the seventh. 
that center field shot, the one we're looking at right now, you can see the Spillner kind of hooks that ball behind his back. Not as much as Sutcliffe, but he does hook it. Yeah, that little wristband. There's a drive slicing down the right field line and drops untouched, bouncing up into the seat. And if Sutcliffe has another year like he had last year, everybody will be hooking that ball. Juan Augusto and Gene Nelson are right-handed, throwing down in the Sox bullpen. Two balls and one strike to count to Willie Randolph. The Yankees scored a run in the first and two in the fifth. There's Augusto and Nelson, the right-hander. Two and one. The Yankees got a run in the first inning. Henderson walked, stole second, took third on a ground ball, and scored on Mattingly's fly ball. In the fifth inning, Henderson homered with Meacham aboard. And there's ball four. So as Randolph goes to first, we go to New York. Benny, the Royals have broken the 3-3 tie in Boston. George Brett singles through the infield into right. That scores Onyx Concepcion, who has some speed. And the Royals have the go-ahead run. 4-3 Kansas City. They're now in the bottom of the seventh. Back to Chicago. Okay, Kansas City up on top. Meanwhile, the Yankees leading 3-1. Now, here's Tony La Russa going to the mound. He's going to make a change. So as we look at Tony and Dan Spilner leads, we have some time and let's pause and we'll be back with you right after this. We have a moment while Juan Augusto warms up. You're looking at Tony La Russa. Okay, I have a question for you. Since the White Sox signed La Russa to be their manager, how many managers have the Yankees employed? Since that same short time, here's the answer. Seven. Enough set. Toby at 64. Oh, look at all that. Looked like a dramatic reading of the yellow pages. <laughs> okay, Augusto's ready to go after Mattingly. And they pick. Backs off the rubber and shoots from the hip, and out he is. Drew Coble breaking the sad news to him. Mm. So one out. It might be Augusto is only pitching to Mattingly, and that'll be it because he is so effective against left-handers who hit less than 200 against him. But right-handers eat him alive. So it could be he gets Mattingly, and Nelson will get Winfield. We'll see drive down the right field line foul one and one Mattingly had a scoring fly ball in the first inning when he picked up Henderson singled in the third flied out in the fifth and he has a nine game hitting streak one and one just missed ball two kind of a unique stance at least with the front foot Mattingly is kind of pigeon toed but what it does it keeps that Front shoulder in there. Roller wide of first base. Greg Walker underhands to Augusto. Now let's see if that theory holds up. Was he brought in only to pitch to the left-hand hitter, or will he stay in and face Winfield? It might also have made a difference because he removed a runner on the base pass. Pitkoff, the pitkoff made right. that decision. So two down, and Larusa stays where he is. And that means Winfield going against Augusta. When I said that right-handers eat him alive in comparison to the left-handers, right-handers hit about 350 against him. That was a good shot at the White Sox bench. You saw Dave Duncan on the phone working with the papers. Joe Nosek, one of the great sign stealers there, and LaRusso with his lineup card. Ball one. Everybody in the ball game, you like that. Makes your bench look alive. Big man has not been in the ball game as far as hits. But remember the classic double play in the third inning. He lost an absolute 
that's your house base hit only to have it turned into a double play on the magic of Cruz and Guillen around second base. And the Pirates have kind of turned the tables on the Mets now. 3-2 in the eighth. One ball, one strike to Winfield. Line drive base hit, so they let him in to pitch to the right-hander. And Winfield promptly bangs it into left field. Of course, Augusto, you have to remember, spent his first year in the majors last year, and I think Tony's going to bring a hook. He figured, okay, I'll let him have a look at a right-hander. That's as much as I want him to have. And this is the one guy in the lineup that he really fears because of the way Baylor hits the White Sox. And Tony made a big point of that, that if it came down to a game situation uh, with uh, Winfield up there, he would rather pitch to Winfield than he would to Baylor. So Gene Nelson will be brought in from the bullpen. In the eighth inning with the Yankees leading 3-1 and trying to get some more. take a moment to remind you folks immediately after baseball a great golf show the legends of golf coming from Austin Texas and a little something special about it too I was here when it was the heat no the special thing is I was sitting there watching that Trevino and Jones and shirt sleeves and here we are freezing but then they're also going to watch Kathy Whitworth yeah. and Mickey Wright and I think it's great and some of the great names in the history of golf so stay right with us after baseball We'll take you to Austin, Texas, where it's a little warmer, and we'll listen to the charming romantic voices of Lee Trevino and Charlie Jones. It ought to be a lot of fun. <laughs> Meanwhile, we got a good one going here. Gene Nelson is about ready, and Don Baylor coming up. It's 3-1 to one in favor of the Yankees. Nelson, as you can see, 0-1. He's out of Tampa, Florida. He came out of the Seattle farm system in exchange for Salome Barojas. He was with the Yankees in 1981, where he was three and one. And he almost got him. Would that have been something? Two relief pitchers picking off two men at first. But Winfield just did get back. Nelson came up with the Yankees in 81, and he was three and one, and then went over to Seattle. Close play. Keeping him close, too. They're playing Baylor to pull. The only guy that uh, Winfield has to worry about is if he has any ideas about stealing is the second baseman, Cruz. So Baylor waiting. Good fastball. Baylor single to right. Lost a hit on a fine play by Scott Fletcher and fly to center. So Don one for three. And Gene Nelson came up with the Yankees. He was the youngest player in the big leagues at the time. He was a tender 20 years old. Fastball. Boy, he's challenging him. And a great play behind the dugout. That a way to go. No glove either. Give me five. <laughs> oh, and two the count. Two down. Three to one Yankees. Top of the eighth. I tell you, he almost picked him off of what he really has accomplished, though. He's cut down Winfield's lead, and that could be important on a base hit. You might get a shot at him at third base. And that's why it is important for pitchers to throw over to first base. Even if you don't pick them off, you cut down their lead, and outfield is a chance. 0-2. Oh Boy, he's throwing fastballs over to first base. That thing really took off. Walker had to really just suddenly rise with it. Two to Don Baylor. He hit it off the end of the bat, and it's going down the left field line. Coming forward is Fletcher, snatches at it, and made the catch. That was a wind help ball that kept it in play. A base hit and nothing else. It's still three to one Yankees. Okay, Jay and Charlie and Lee. Hey, hang on there with our buddy Goldie. Got a root for Bob along with Miller Barber. Look at that foul ball catch by Scott Fletcher. That ball looked like it was in the stands. Fletcher stayed with it and at the last minute makes the snatch and it's another good play. The Sox have come up with five excellent defensive plays. And of course the best one of all was the double play in the third inning. This was the scoring. 
Henderson walked, stole second, took third on an infield out. Mattingly picked him up with a fly ball. Then in the fifth inning, after Meacham walked, Henderson hit it out. 3-0 Yankees. In the seventh inning, an error on Salazar's ball by Bobby Meacham, then a single by Guillen, and Fletcher's single got Salazar to get him close. Twice today, Harold Baines has come up to the plate where he represented either the tying or possibly even winning run, and he's been tied up by Yankee pitching. Now in the eighth inning, Tom Peshorek, followed by Carlton Fisk and Mark Hill as the Sox are starting to run out of time. And one of the premier pitchers in the game, Dave Rigetti, going to work. Fastball hit and backhanded at third by Dale Barra. And he throws him out. Good play. One down. So it's catching now. We've had some excellent defensive play. It's a little odd that we have had so many good defensive plays. One of the oldest axioms in baseball, you always get good defensive plays behind control pitches. But heck, we had great plays and there were 10 walks in the first four innings. So it's a little different today. Well, I guess maybe the cold weather, the infielders don't want to just lay back on their toes. They want to keep moving and anticipating. Boy, that's a good thought. Here's Carlton Fisk. Ball one. Pudge has walked, fouled out twice. And his first foul out was important. He came up with a runner at second for Shorek and nobody out. Fouled out, failed to advance him, and of course, they're trailing by two now. Ground ball wide a third. There is Dale Barra. And that takes care of that. Two down. The batter will be Mark Hill. You know, they asked the question, how'd Yogi get along? And I said, it's, if, you, if there's a way to figure it out, Yogi will figure it out. And when I, I heard the question asked it here, and Yogi said, well, I just, uh, I probably say, Dale, do this. And when I called him, he says, what? Just like every other player. <laughs> That's right. You say, hey, Dale, what? what? Like any other player. <laughs> I fly ball into left. Any other day, it's gone, but not today. That thing's in the seats, but the breeze just cut it down. And for Mark Hill, a long fly ball, and he comes up empty. At the end of eight, the Yankees three, and the White Sox one. next Saturday, NBC Sports continues its coverage of the 85 baseball season. Two National League contests. Some of you will watch a rematch of the playoff battle of Padres and the Cubs at Wrigley Field. Others will see the Mets and Pete Rose's Cincinnati Reds. Next Saturday, beginning at 1 Eastern with Major League Baseball, an inside look. The tradition is here. The memories are waiting on NBC Sports. Interesting little uh, box or side note to this game today. You remember a little while ago in a game at Yankee Stadium, Julio Franco hit a game-winning home run to beat the Yankees for Cleveland. And then the next day, that failed to show up. They didn't know where he was. And they looked all over New York. And as the story went, he was found living in a friend's house without a telephone. He wasn't well. So he didn't call anybody, just stayed in bed. In the course of looking for Julio Franco, they contacted the New York Police Department. And I remember Franco had just hit the game-winning yeah. home run the night before, and they said, do you know Julio Franco? And the New York Police Department said, never heard of him. And Moss Klein of the Star Ledger of Newark wrote, it just shows you that ninth inning home runs against the Yankees don't make much news these days. Is that an arrow? But that's early. Yankees are leading here three to one in the ninth. And Billy Sample with the count 0 and 2. Gene Nelson trying to keep the Yankees quiet to look ahead in the bottom of the ninth. The White Sox are due to send up Greg Walker, Luis Salazar, and Ozzy Guillen. Breaking ball fouled away. watching Gene Nelson his fourth pitcher it's been Lawler, Spilner, Augusto and Nelson no balls, two strikes one and two he didn't have a good
good cut at the curveball. You can't guess with two strikes, but if I were catching, that's what I'd call for. One and two. Nope, he came high again with it. Another fastball. Two balls, two strikes. ball a curveball and it's lined to left and over there to flag it is Tom Fishore. Well, he hit the curve pretty hard that time but the count was two and two. Now one out and Dale Barra coming up. This is interesting and Joe I've really got a question about this. Barra has reached first on catcher's interference 18 times. Is there anything you see in his stance or his swing or anything he does that you could come up, go foul, so we can watch him swing again? Thank you very much. 0-1 oh, the count. Go 18 times, meaning the catcher has tipped his back. What is there about his swing? Have you watched it? It looks like at times he just dips back a little bit, and it's not, uh, I mean, doesn't shift his weight. His weight is back, but he goes back with the bat. Right like a hitch. The, yeah. See, see, now look, there's Mark Hill. He's got plenty of room. Now, now. watch where the glove is. Now, if he goes forward, he's all right. Right before he started right to stride, he was all right that time. I don't say he's going to do it this time, but usually when it happens, I watch Mark Hill move back. He's aware of it. He'll give him some room. He's got plenty of room. Right there. The drive to left and Pashorek to the wall off the wall. Oh, he played the Karen perfectly. The throw in towards second. It is not in time. So Pasorek made a quick recovery of the short hop. Let's take another look at Dale's swing. Hit that ball hard. And he's digging hard. Hey, you know what? That bat was close to hitting the glove that time. Did you see that? I really didn't. Wait, wait till they go back. Can you show us that one more time, please? Just the swing, if we have it. And slowly, it, it happened so quickly, but it came off. Watch Hill's glove now in the bat. Look at that. That was pretty close. That's just one of those oddities in the game, why it catches interference calls so many times against Dale Barra. Butch Weiniger now trying to pick him up. Ball one. Weiniger could be two for two. Grounded to third, grounded to second, and thrown out on a couple of good plays. Three to one Yankees, top of the ninth inning. Weiniger trying to pick up Barra from second base. That time it looked like Nelson was thrown to the plate while he was looking back at second. He was so conscious of Dale Barra. I don't know how he could have found the strike zone. Three and oh. Ball four. Coming up next. But right now, Bobby Meacham is coming up. Two on, one out. Ninth inning. Three to one Yankees. The Yankees scored a run in the first, two in the fifth. Sox got one in the seventh, and that's it. Dennis Rasmussen went six and two-thirds. Rigetti trying to hold it for him. And Lawler, Spilner, Augusto, and Nelson working for Chicago. Oh, and one. There is no one throwing in the Chicago bullpen, so it's up to Nelson to get him out. pitch a change a straight change with a great delivery it was up and that's the only bad thing you could say about it but the speed on it he really had Meacham already committed just floated by 0 oh and 2 to Bobby and the express as Roy Campanella used to call the fastball after the change meanwhile you have Barra at second Weininger at first one out the attendance today, and it's a tribute to the Chicago White Sox fans, 22,788 in 40 degree weather that has seen it rain and a 15 mile per hour wind. Slow roller to Cruz, tried to tag and got him and makes the double play. And the Yankees will argue 
but he tagged Weiniger going by, and Yogi's going out to join in with Stump in arguing with Don Denkinger. Watch this. It may be when on the baseline, I think he does not make the tag, as you can see plainly. The baseline thing is what they're arguing. Look at Yogi. He is really upset. And Yogi will not argue unless he really believes it, because last year he tried to get thrown out of a game, but they respected him so much they wouldn't throw him out. Remember the runner, Weiniger, when he tried to avoid the tag, has just about stepped on the fringe of the grass. Feet either side. Right. And since the ball was hit, that would fool you at first. You would think, well, he's gone way inside. But if you look at the base, you figure you have a three-foot lane on either side of the bag. Take another look at it. Now there's Here the bag. Now, now he's on the baseline. There he goes. Now he's on the grass. Now was he out three feet outside? Hard to say. Very hard to say. But on behalf of the Don Denkinger Marching and Chowder Society, the umpire at second base, it shall duly be noted in the minutes of the last meeting that it was a double play, and that will be that. He let Yogi have his say, I'll say that. Well, we got a hot time in a cold city today. And before we go to the bottom of the ninth, the Major League Baseball Game of the Week has been brought to you by Ford, who invites you to drive the new Ford Escort. Have you driven a Ford lately? By light beer from Miller, everything you've always wanted in a beer, and less. By the Vic Shaver for normal skin, and the Vic Shaver for sensitive skin. Now there's double trouble for stubble. And by Armor All, it's science, oh, but it works like magic. As Yogi kind of stews and simmers in the Yankee dugout, he's also leading three to one in the bottom of the ninth inning. And it'll be Greg Walker, Louis Salazar, and Ozzie Guillen. Let's get an update from the legends, and then we'll be back here to pick up the bottom of the ninth. Don't keep it too long, you Texans. All right, in Boston, the Red Sox have tied it up in the bottom of the eighth against Kansas City. Dan Quisenberry, the stopper for Dick Hauser on the hill. But Rick Miller singles. That scores Marty Barrett. And they are all tied up at Fenway. And they're going tonight. And that's the strangest golf update I ever heard. Well, we just bogeyed one. I'd like to thank the fellas for their direction. And now let's take a look at Greg Walker. Oh, and one. has a lot of home runs in his young career, 38 of them, but only three against left-handers. The Sox aren't looking for a home run now anyway. They want to get something started down by two. Good pitch for a strike. Rigetti is really throwing hard. You can see why he would be such a valuable guy in a bullpen. You certainly hate to take him out of rotation. It was a controversial move, but with five saves already and seeing what he's done here today, uh, hey, that's a real luxury. Paper being retrieved by Ricky Henderson, so timeout. 0 oh 2 the count. I've always wondered about that. Is it some. Where are you going with that? Oh, I'm going to the ball game. Oh. <laughs> and you throw it on the field. <laughs> 3 to 1 Yankees, bottom of the ninth. 1 and 2 the count. That's a paraphrase of that great Joe Medley thing when they threw the fruit at him in Detroit. He said, I couldn't understand that, but I, the thing that bothered me is why would you go to the ballpark with carloads of fruit? I don't know. People who feed one and two to count. To Greg Walker. Inside. Well, it's time for the NBC light beer from Miller, player of the game. And now that Rasmussen is gone, I guess it's a fairly easy decision unless the Sox get off the floor, huh? Two and two to count. Ground ball to short. Bobby Meacham up with that. That'll take care of Greg Walker. So barring a tremendous turnabout, 
Our Miller player of the game will be Ricky Henderson. And Light Beer from Miller, happy to present a check for $1,000 in the name of Ricky Henderson to help fight multiple sclerosis. He walked, scored a base, and then brought home the run after stealing second and hit a two-run home run. Luis Salazar, walk popped up and a board on the error. 0 for 2. Yankees in the ninth with one out. Salazar 0 for 2. Jerry Hairston is out on deck as a pinch hitter. The executive producer of NBC Sports is Michael Weissman. And the coordinating producer for NBC Baseball, Harry Coyle. The telecast of today's game of the week, produced by George Finkel, directed by Harry Coyle. And there's a base hit into left field. So Salazar keeps it alive. And now Hairston will come up to hit for Gian. We do like to salute the people who have worked so hard, so we'd like to also salute our free game produced by Les Dennis, free game directed by Mary Duda Lamusio, and technical directors Bruce Berquist and Sal Nagita. And now, with the ball game on the line, here comes Jerry Hairston and Hub Kittle. Uh, Ron Kittle comes out on deck. So Kittle and Hairston with one out. And Hairston coming up to hit for Guillen. Well, he was a great pinch hitter last year, was Hairston. He led the American League with 18 pinch hits. He's not at 100%. He's got a leg problem, so the ground ball is really suspect for a double play. Hairston, a switch hitter, and he has hit much better as a right-handed batter, although he hasn't had very many at-bats this year. He has more power left-handed. And the power man on deck, of course, in Ron Kittle. Ball one. Three to one Yankees, bottom of the ninth, one out. The Sox have threatened... In the second inning, in the fourth inning, in the fifth inning, finally scored in the seventh, and they're trying to move around in the ninth. Held up, it'll cost a strike anyway. Hairston has the nickname of Popeye. He's had two brothers who played pro baseball. In fact, his brother John appeared with the Cubs in 1969. Valuable man on the club, Hairston. Oh, he's had 50 hits in his career as with the White Sox as a pinch hitter. Fastball strike. One and two. So Dave Rigetti, who is bare-armed, that makes him a little different than anybody else in uniform today. Everyone else is bundled up, but not Dave. piece of that breaking ball and fought it off. Standing at first, Luis Salazar. He runs well enough. And Hairston, the tying run at the plate, Kittle to follow. Chip off the old block department. Jerry's dad has been a longtime White Sox employee who scouts and also serves as a minor league instructor, so it runs in the family. And his dad, Sam, also appeared in the major leagues for the White Sox in 1951. Two balls, two strikes. Ball three. Boy, that was a tough pitch, and he hurt himself taking it. He was, he was getting therapy before the game. And uh, he's got that leg problem, so the ground ball, he's really suspect. He, he's hurting. It's in the shift of the weight. He's going to hold up right here. And that's, oh, you can feel it right there. So you got a guy with a bad wheel up there at the plate representing the tying run, but also representing a game-ending double play. A rather interesting situation. 
With Salazar at first, one out of the ninth, three one Yankees. The Roos has got a decision. Three and two. And he's walked him. And the Sox are alive. And Kittle coming up. We're going to have a runner naturally because, as we pointed out, Hairston has a bad leg. And it'll be Darrell Boston. Getty on the spot. Kittle slammed into the wall and hurt his shoulder. He can't throw yet. So he couldn't start. But he can swing the bat. Hit 32 home runs last year. 35 the year before. Ball one. High pop fly foul Mattingly coming over to the railing and this one is back in a half a dozen rows. Remember this play. This is the biggest play of the week at least. Watch. Cruz. And then throwing out of the glove, hanging it to Gian, who bare hands and double up Winfield. And that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we're in the ninth inning with one out, and the Sox trying to pull it out. It's three to one Yankees. Just missed. So Dave Rigetti, who came in in the seventh inning with two out and got Harold Baines retired the side in order in the eighth and now fighting here in the ninth. He has Salazar at second, Boston at first, the tying runs with one out. Fouled away. He is six, four, weighs 220 and they call him Kitty. But he looks like a tiger right now in this spot. And Rigetti on that last pitch just simply challenged him. And that's what you have to do right now with the game on the line. There's no finesse going here. It's you and me, pal. It's uh, just a shootout. Two balls, two strikes. throwing heat he came back with the breaking ball and Kittle just couldn't do a thing with it there's oh. nothing you can do when a guy throws as hard as Rigetti and then you snap off a curveball like that all you do is leave a pair of shoes in the batter's box watch this breaking ball it is a beauty and he throws it in the clutch and there's nothing you can do but just watch it sail by and the mm. pressure's really on your shoestrings what a pitch he made that's Boy. the pitch of the game right there Whew. Well, now, once again, for the third time, they're asking Scott Fletcher to extend an inning and let Harold Baines have a shot. And Fletcher is two for two in extension. Ball one. He had struck out in the first and third, but he singled in the fifth to give Baines a shot, and Baines fly to center. He singled a right to drive in a run with two out in the seventh, and Baines grounded out. So twice, Fletcher had the tough spot. Twice, he was equal to the challenge, and now they're asking him to do it a third time. And the count is 2-0. And, oh. and there's Harold, who is the, the man that they need. Now, two balls and no strikes. You got the big guy. Do you let him hit or do you let him, uh, you make him take? And for those folks in New York, the Pirates knock off the Mets. It's 3-1 Yankees. Ninth inning, two out. Scott Fletcher trying to keep it alive for Harold Baines. And almost hit Baines with the foul ball. Baines took a swipe at it and knocked it over to the railing. He's ready to hit even in the on-deck circle. And as usual, got a piece of the ball. Boy, 
this has been a good game. We've had some great plays. Everything you want and come right down to the last shot. Had everything. Salazar at second. Boston at first. Two out in the ninth. And there goes the runner to third. There's a looper in the right field. Here comes Salazar. Going to third is Boston. And here comes Harold Bain. It's 3-2 Yankees. really appreciates but it'll get lost in the box score three hits in a row to let Baines get up there and the third time was the charm for Baines and the White Sox two and one ball three so they're one pitch away from holding them up and Carlton Fisk is on deck all right you got a right hand hitter left hand pitcher three and one to count oh Did you let a... Wimpy take a swing oh yes with him definitely Definitely. I think I would have had Fletcher to take him, though. But Three and one. He got the base hit, and that's all that counts. Ground ball to short, and Meacham is up with it. Throws high, and Mattingly stayed with it. And we're going into extra innings. So the White Sox get off the floor, two runs, three hits, and leave two. And at the end of nine, a 3-3 three, three tie. Three runs, six hits, an error for the Yankees. Three runs, seven hits, no errors for the White Sox. One home run in the game by Ricky Henderson. The Sox now have Darrell Boston in center field. Louis Salazar takes over at third, and Tom Hewlett is at second base. 
Boy, have we got a dandy Perkin here as we go into the 10th inning. Now, for all you folks who have joined us, the Yankees and the White Sox, 3-3 in the 10th. Ricky Henderson up there. High fly ball into left field. Pashorek is there. have led all the way. The Yankees led 1-0, 3-0, 3-1. And the White Sox with two in the ninth inning have gotten even. I'm Ben Scully along with Joe Garagiola and you have joined us at the right time. Here's Willie Randolph. Grounded to short and walked, doubled and walked again. He's one for two. Breaking ball, a good one. A great play by Cruz certainly looms bigger and bigger when he took a base hit away from Winfield and turned it into a double play. But the base on balls, which is no defense against, is what's really hurt the Yankees. Fast ball, and he was late after the curve and fouled it away. So Gene Nelson, who came in to try and just keep things quiet, is now going head to head with the Yankees, battling for a decision. The same Nelson who was a Yankee. Pitch away, one and two. On deck, Don Mattingly. So a crowd of 22,788, and they literally had to brave the elements, but it's been worth it. One and two. this thing just a little dip at the end of it it started high and apparently gave up on it and down she comes Mike Riley says it was a strike meanwhile La Russa, who got that 11th hour reprieve with two in the ninth can now sit back for the moment and relax as Don Mattingly climbs in ball one fastball ran away Mattingly had a scoring fly ball in the first inning, single in the third, fly to center and grounded out since. Hitting 267 and strokes it into left center for a base hit. Boston over to cut it off. So Mattingly, a two-out single in the tenth, and the batter will be Dave Winfield. Duncan has come out to the White Sox uh, dugout, and uh, Mark Hill is out there, and this could be one of those situations. Now, you've got Winfield up there, but Baylor is the man behind him, and that's going to dictate some of the moves as far as pitching to uh, Winfield. The Yankees have only played one extra inning game so far. They are 0 and 1. The White Sox have played two previous extra inning games. They're 2 and 0. In the White Sox bullpen, the fellow who had to fight the last inning last night to preserve a 4-2 victory to Tom Seaver, Bob James, and there he is. So two down in the 10th inning, and Dave Winfield against Gene Nelson. Don Baylor on deck. Winfield grounded out, hit into the best double play you'll ever see, Fly to left and single. Ball one. Winfield one for four. Greg Walker at first. 3-3 three, three tie. The totals are identical. Three runs, seven hits for each team. Slider hit down to short. The feed to second, and that's it. The Yankees, no run. One hit, one left. And at the end of nine and a half, the Yankees three and the White Sox three. And here comes Fisk and Hill and Walker. In left field is the fellow who played with the Chicago Cubs last year, now playing for the New York Yankees, Henry Cotto. And on the mound, a fellow who had briefly been up with Minnesota and Toronto, Don Cooper. Cooper came over to the Yankees from Toronto, and he throws hard. Two years ago, he led the International League in strikeouts. Briefly this year at Columbus, he was in five games, one win, no losses, and did not allow an earned run. So Cooper and Cotto, that means the Yankees have Mattingly, Randolph, Meacham, and Barra, 
Cotto, Henderson, and Winfield. Weininger behind the plate. And Cooper on the hill. Harold Baines thinking whatever thoughts you have when you had been given the opportunities twice and then cashed it in the third time. His double in the ninth inning knocked in the tying run and forced this game into overtime. And to the bottom of the tenth inning we go. Carlin Fisk walked, fouled out twice and grounded out and is now asked to get something started with Mark Hill to follow. He has three home runs, 12 RBIs, Pudge hitting 283. Good breaking ball, started him right off with number two. And in a good spot. One ball, one strike. You'll notice the pitchers blowing on their hand. For those who joined us a little late, this game began in 40 degree weather. So the umpires have certainly given the pitchers the opportunity to try and get a little heat in there. Ball two. We've had 12 walks that I've been able to keep track of, and I really think most of them because of the weather. It's so hard to guide that ball. Two balls, one strike. Another breaking ball. That one. ball just squibbed out. He, he couldn't snap that one off. It, it was like the, the bar of soap in the shower. He just squibbed out of there. Larry Cirillo and all the boys will follow with the legends of golf as soon as this great game is over with, so stay with us. Three and one. Fastball, hit foul. I was wondering when he's going to turn the heat loose. You don't think Carlton was looking for it, do you? <laughs> yeah, I sure do. He got around on that one in plenty of time. And apparently broke the bat. And two the count to Carlton Fisk. He just kept getting one hook after the next, and then finally got the fastball 3 1 and pulled it foul. 3 and 2. Fisk is 0 for 3. Mark Hill is 0 for 3. And Walker is 0 for 4. So there is not a hit amongst them. That's an 0 for 10 stretch there in the middle of the White Sox lineup. Three and two to Carlton Fisk. Fastball and a high fly ball up into that wind. No chance for it to go anywhere. Henry Cotto puts it away. One down. in the Yankee bullpen, Yogi has dispatched the message to get Bob Shirley up. And he's another bear arm. Why is it the left-handers don't have any long sleeve shirts? What is there about left-handers? <laughs> Everybody else is bundled up, but the two left-handers we see are dressed like they're in Miami. They're left-handed, and they're going to prove it. Don't say that. But I did. I know, and I'm left-handed. Hill 0 for 3. there. One and one. Mark Hill lost a hit in the sixth inning. Bobby Meacham made a good play to get him, remember? Oh, he went to his mouth uh -oh. twice. Oh, he, he went twice. Yeah. He called it a ball. So add one to the count. They'll let you do that. But evidently, he must have licked his fingers. Two and one. Fouled away. For the folks out in the West Coast who might have lost the signal briefly, the Yankees led one nothing. Henderson's legs got him around to third, and a fly ball by Mattingly got him home. Henderson hit a two-run home run in the fifth, and it was three nothing Yankees. The Sox 
got a run in the seventh inning. A single by Fletcher scored Salazar, who had gotten aboard on an error, and three hits, including a key single by Scott Fletcher and a double by Baines, got the game even, and we're in the tenth inning. Fastball fouled away. That rule I never could understand. You walk three feet off the mound, you can go to your mouth. On the mound, it's a ball. On a day like today, if you would wet that ball and try to throw a spit ball, it would come up as an ice ball. So, I mean, the rule is... I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, because it's freezing. I would, I would let anybody. I'd let him put a bucket out there and dip it if he <laughs> wants. Two and two, if you could get it through the water. That's right. Go ice fishing. Two and two to Hill. Fastball, all three. You know, we talk about being cold and hitting and how it hurts your hand. How about catching? Oh, it hurts your hand. Make no bones about that. But now they got these gloves with the break is right down the middle. They catch it in the weapon, so you really don't feel it most of the time. Three and two. Fastball on the corner, and Hill can't believe it. Right on the outside corner, it's one of those pitches too close to take. And he took it, and he called it a strike. Take a look at it. What do you think? I mean, when you got two strikes on you, you just can't be taking pitches like this. Well, here's Greg Walker, who was 0 for 4, but he's finally getting a look at a right-handed pitcher. And, of course, he can turn the lights out, this kid, with one swing. Big, slow, downer, ball one. Oddly enough, Dale Bear at third base is really guarding the line, even though we got a left-handed batter up there. Look at that. And Mattingly is almost on the grass and close to the line at first. And he pulled it by Mattingly. So if Mattingly, if it were early in the game, Mattingly makes the play. But, of course, in the 10th inning, guarding the lines, Don was over on the line, and the ground ball is over there. And a dive still won't help. So Walker, so happy to see a right-hand pitcher. Singles to right, and the drought is over for him. And Louis Salazar, the batter. Walked intentionally, popped up, was aboard on the error by Bobby Meacham, and singled in that wild ninth inning. And Barra is on the line at third, Mattingly holding the corner on Walker at first. 3-3, bottom of the tenth. I say, boy, Weininger, what a job he has done today. He's really been a gopher. He's been in that dirt all afternoon. Mm. Weininger looks like a goalie on a bad hockey team. He's been boxing everything down in the dirt. Look at that. Another one. Hey, he's, he's a good low ball catcher. He gets down. He, he digs it out. He stays with it. and no strikes. Walker inching off the bag at first. Salazar at the plate with two out. Tenth inning, 3-3. Three, three. And he missed again. Remember, Darrell Boston, who ran for Jerry Hashton and stayed in the game. Darrell Boston is on deck. There he is, tuning up. to second base on the walk to Salazar. Walker advances to second, and Yogi advances to the mound. Now, Boston is a left-hand hitter, and Bob Shirley has been down in the bullpen, and I think they want Shirley. Coming in 3 3, and the ball game is on the line. We'll be right back. We're in the bottom of the 10th inning in a 3 3 tie. Bob Shirley becomes the fourth Yankee pitcher and the eighth pitcher in the game. And the most important stat now is that base on ball. Each side has given the other seven walks. So we've had 14 walks in the game. And the last walk to Salazar meant the end for Don Cooper. So Shirley will go against Darrell Boston. Bob Shirley out of the University of Oklahoma picked up his first Yankee and American League win in 83 at Yankee Stadium, having spent 
three and a half, four years with San Diego, briefly with St. Louis and Cincinnati. Second, the winning run, Louis Salazar at first, two out. And Darrell Boston trying to settle things himself. Ground foul down the line. Right by Joe Nosek. Then the count 0 and 2. Darrell Boston seemed like he was everywhere but Boston last year. Three times he shuttled back and forth from Chicago to Denver and back to Chicago again. 0-2 to count. And that takes care of him. So Shirley comes in, punches out Boston, no runs, one hit, and two left. And at the end of 10, a 3-3 tie. We'll be back. into the 11th inning in a 3-3 tie. Don Baylor, Henry Cotto, and Dale Berra in that order. Last ball missing from Gene Nelson, ball one. Baylor today, single to right, robbed of a hit by Scott Fletcher, flied to center, and then Fletcher made a great catch of his foul ball. As far as Baylor is concerned, Fletcher is no longer in the game. Salazar is now playing third. Ian had to come out. One ball and one strike. Fletcher and Salazar back of him, along with Pishorek, Boston, and Baines in the outfield, and Hill behind the plate. Gene battling for the decision in this 3-3 tie. Fouled away. Strange day. We actually have some blue skies now, and if you remember, if you were with us then, a couple of innings ago, the Yankees were in the field and actually had to come in and get some sunglasses. So it's been almost any kind of a day you want to call it. Cold, windy, rainy, sunny. But the constant has been cold. Three and two. Just did get a little bit of a, of a hard slider. And he had to almost go across the plate just to stay alive. That's a classic example of fighting off a good pitch as we look at Salazar. Three and two to Don Baylor hands and hit foul so it shows you one minute he had to go after the slider away and got a piece of it and then that time he had a fight off one that was eating him up inside three and two line drive base hit into left field so in the 11th inning Baylor opens up with a base hit his second Eight hits for Chicago, and now three runs, eight hits for the Yankees. Here are a couple of final scores of other games. Pirates beat the Mets three to two. Kansas City turned one over on Boston, five four. Montreal over St. Louis, eight to three. The butt up along first, down to get it is Nelson throws, and a good play by Hewlett. That throw is down at the ankles, and on the sacrifice, Baylor takes second. So Henry Cotto moved him up a notch. And what a beautiful bunt that was. He really deadened it, and it was a, a much tougher play as you look at it. It is really dead here. Nelson comes up, and looks like for a minute he might let it roll. Makes a kind of a low throw. It could have gone into right field just as easily as not. So a good play by Hewlett. And, of course, a fellow like Hewlett should be commended. One of the toughest jobs in the world. You're always talking about coming up as a pinch hitter. But how about sitting in the dugout in 40-degree weather and suddenly in the ninth inning they discover you and say, go in and play second base. A little pop fly 
linebacker first. Hewlett going behind Walker and makes the catch. Two down in the 11th. And Butch Weiniger, who has done such a great job with the glove, is now asked to do something with the bat. Butch has walked twice, grounded out twice. He's 0 for 2. If you're looking ahead, when the Sox come up in the 11th, they'll have Hewlett, Fletcher, and Baines. And they will take the bat right out of Weininger's hand. They'll walk him intentionally and take their best shots with Bobby Meacham. That is the eighth walk given to the Yankees today. And the 15th walk in the game. Bruce Yogi's got some guys over there. He's got Griffey on the fence. If he wants to make a move for Meacham, and it looks like Griffey is getting a bat. Griffey, who did not hit a lick against Chicago pitching last year, is evidently going to come up and hit for Bobby Meacham. With two on, two out on the 11th, and a 3-3 tie. Griffey last year hit only 160 against Chicago pitching. He went 0 for 4 last night. goes back through the books figuring out how to pitch to him sometimes I'm not sure if the Sox books are like that but I remember years ago when Branch Rickey owned the Dodgers and Alan Roth was the statistician and they would have a diagram of a field and let's say it was Joe Garagiola the hitter and every base hit you got as a right-handed hitter would be in left field most of them anyway and as you got older and the bat and reflexes were a little slower why those base hits would begin to fan right. and instead of all going to left some of them would start going to right center and that would be the time to deal you away that was his theory deal him a year too soon rather than a year too late well dave duncan talking to gene nelson about how they want him to pitch to ken griffey making his notes as he subtracts Griffey in this game of chess going on and a 3-3 tie and what a game it is. Ken Griffey finds two men aboard. Weininger at first, Baylor at second and the pitch gets behind the plate and everybody moves up. Now what do you do? You have two out and first base open and you have Ricky Henderson on deck. the best communications in the world here so we're checking and it is a wild pitch so Yogi who saw his Yankees strand 14 last night and lose now sees them with runners at second and third and two out in the 11th two and oh and the message evidently is to keep the ball in and down on Griffey by Mark Hill. He smothered that one. He got all over. There was no way that ball was going to get by him. Good play. In and down, but not that far down. Watch this. Watch how he gets over in front of this one. All right, 3-0 and oh to Griffey. With first base open and Henderson on deck and two out. On the corner for a strike. Ken Griffey has over 1,500 hits in his career. Ken comes from Denora, Pennsylvania. And of course, that was put on the maps many, many years ago, 40 years ago, by a fellow named Stan Hughes. Arnold Galiff, the Army guy. Three and two. Ball four. Another walk. <laughs> that means nine walks have been given to the Yankees. That's 16 walks in the game. <laughs> it's remarkable when you think about it. 16 walks. It's going to gray LaRusso's hair. He was the youngest manager in the big leagues when this game started. But 16 walks, and yet it's a 3-3 three, three tie. You would think it's 10-9. Pitchers don't know if they're working with two infields for crying out loud. That's right. 
Henderson hit a two run home run. And that at the time appeared to make him the standout player in the game. We'll see. Weiniger at second, Ken Griffey at first, and Ricky trying to break the tie in the 11th. And now for Nelson, all the heat is on him. He has got to throw strikes, and remember, he has walked two in a row. And of course, he walked the hitter intentionally. That immediately led him down the primrose path to walk another, and now he's on the edge of walking in a tie-breaking run. 2-0, and, oh, and Henderson's making it tough. Ball three. How'd you like to find a strike when Ricky starts to shrink? And he's been up. He's been all over the place. Up. He's been in. His curveball hasn't been snapping, so there's really not any consistency to his wildness where you could go out and say, hey, you got to bend your back and do this or do that. He's just been all over the place. 3-0. Oh. In there. 3-1. What do you do now if you're Yogi? You let him hit? No. I got to turn him loose. Okay. Three and one to Henderson. Ball four and that away. walks in the run. That is the fourth walk given up by Nelson. The tenth walk that the Yankees have received and the seventeenth walk in the game. That uh, wasn't even close, man. No, no. And I know it's not right. It's crazy. But it's just one of my theories. Once you start walking people intentionally, look out. And he walked Weiniger, and now he can't find a strike zone. He's walked three in a row. And Willie Randolph, the batter. And he's got to be careful of the first pitch here if he lets up on it. Strike. Randolph walked twice, as in everybody. Grounded out, struck out, and doubled. Another one came back fastball. I think he laid a little angry on that pitch. He had on that one, he had something on him. That first pitch he threw was a breaking ball, which uh, really got him back on the track. 0-2 oh the count. 4-3 Yankees in the 11. Foul tip. And the Yankees get a tie-breaking run, but much to the anguish of Yogi Berra, they leave three more. And it's 4-3 Yankees as we go to the bottom of the 11. Okay, Charlie, my man, we'll get it to you as soon as this is over. And we're going to the bottom of the 11th inning. It is cold. Who cares? You got a pretty girl in a blanket? Let him play on, McDuff. Tom Hewlett and Timmy hitting 286. Then it's Scott Fletcher and Harold Bain. And Bob Shirley trying to win it. The Yankees are leading. But, of course, they have received 10 walks, and they have managed to leave nine men on base, which means they have left 23 men on, counting last night and today. But they'll take it if they can win it. Pagliarulo is now at third base for the Yankees. And Berra has moved over to shortstop. Tim has another look. Strike one and two. Yogi talking to Lou Pinella is leading 4-3 in the 11. Boy, Weiniger was hanging outside long before Shirley released that one. He wanted to make sure he got it out there. Here's his pitch of decision right here. Two and two to Tim Hewlett. 4-3 Yankees, bottom of the 11th inning. way off the plate. That's all we need now, and I'm sure Shirley and all the Yankees are thinking about it. Another base on ball. They've had 17 in the game. Out of way. has seen his club leave a dozen. Talking about Barrow watching the Yankees leave nine, and there's a little looper to right. It's going to fall. Base hit for Hewlett. And the Sox aren't finished yet with Fletcher, Baines, and Peshore coming up. That is 
hit number nine for Chicago, hit number one off Shirley. Those three hits for Fletcher have really been important. He had struck out his first two at-bats. But Fletcher singled in the fifth inning to give Baines a shot, singled in the seventh inning to give Baines a shot, and then singled in the ninth inning, and that's the shot Baines finally needed. He doubled in the tying run. And he's bunting his Fletcher. Ball one instead. One and all. Of course, it's interesting. If he bunts him over, will Shirley pitch to Harold Baines, even though it's left-hander and left-hander? Well, that's a decision Yogi will have to make. But you'll be putting the winning run on if you put him on. The bullpens are quiet. We've used up eight pitchers, four on each side. And he's swinging, base hit to right. Hewlett's going to be stopped at second base. And boy, it is a good thing he was looking at Jim Leyland because Leyland had him stopped immediately and Winfield would have shot the eyes out of him. And here comes Harold Baines and there goes Mark Connors to the mound to talk to Shirley. And they're going wild again as Yogi makes another phone call. about the soldier, the private, while the general gets the stars. How about giving a star to Scott Fletcher? He has really done the job today. He's gotten the big base hits. We talked about how he's going to get lost in the box score. It'll look great because he's got four base hits. But here's the guy. Listen to the fans. The chant is Harold, Harold. third and down the line to drive in Daryl Boston and tie up the game. Dale Murray has gotten up to throw in the Yankee bullpen because as Dale heats up after Baines comes to shore it. There's to and the game now is in the hands of Harold Baines and Bob Shirley. Line drive into center, charging the ball is Henderson, and they will hold Hewlett at third, and the bases are loaded with nobody out. He jumped on that first ball again. He's somebody, someday somebody's going to believe it. There was no thought in Jim Leyland's mind of having his runner, Hewlett, go anywhere but to third. Yeah, I think he would have knocked him down if he even rounded the bag. So with the bases loaded, nobody out, four to three Yankees in the 11th, La Russa now is wondering, as Berra, whether Peshorek can finally cash it in. It was Peshorek who came up with runners at second and third in the ninth inning with a chance to win it, and Wimpy couldn't do it. Now he has the bases loaded and nobody out. He has a chance to tie it and win it. It's 4-3 Yankees, bottom of the 11th. Hewlett at third, Fletcher at second, Baines at first. And we're watching the Yankee infield now as they all gesture towards Yogi Berra. And the infield is up. Now, after they get the word from Gene Michaels, who comes up the steps, they start to go back. But the entire infield was questioning where should they play. Loops into right field. That'll fall. That'll get one run in. They're going 90 feet a time in Chicago. And it's all tied up on four consecutive singles. A modest thing, but sign owned for Tom Fischorek. A blooper to right. He's got to make that long walk once again out to the mound. Fisk is the White Sox hitter, and he's going to make a change with Murray. He hits it on the end of the bat, and it's a, it's a quail, a seagull, whatever you want, and it's going to drop in front of Winfield. He can't do a thing about it. So Hewlett finally made it home. He just kept making pit stops at second, then to third, and then to home. And on four consecutive singles, it's tied up, the base is loaded, nobody out. How'd you like to give that spot to Dale Murray? Yogi Berra standing behind Gene Michaels would not be
be human if he's not thinking to himself right now, what do I have to do to win a game? I have brought in the right man at the right time, and no matter what move I make, it turns to mud. And the base on balls have been killing him. I tell you, the only thing he could have done would be to put a no left turn sign up there because that's all they've been doing this inning. In the 11th inning, with the Yankees leading 4-3, to three, the White Sox have had four consecutive hits. Hewlett, Fletcher, Baines, and Pashorek. And now here is Carlton Fisk with a chance to win it. The outfield is as if it is a softball game, and it's up to Carlin Fisk to break the tie. The Sox, four runs, 12 hit. The Yankees, four runs, eight hit. And Dale Murray pitching with the bases loaded and nobody out. The old comics line, I wouldn't give this spot to a leopard. Mark Hill is on deck. finish it off and Dale Murray to say backs against the walls would be an understatement here nobody out and the base is loaded strike on the corner about the knees one and one now you know Harold Baines had several opportunities and couldn't do it and then finally did on the third Tom Pishorek had an opportunity and couldn't do it and succeeded in his second Carlton Fisk has had an opportunity and has been given a golden chance now. One and one. And a looper. Base hit. The game is over. The White Sox win it. 5-4. Five, Five consecutive hits of assorted kinds in the 11th inning. because he had so many key hits today to set the table, and that would be Scott Fletcher, who had four hits and let the big guys clean up. But Joe Garaziola, this is Ben Scully. Hope you enjoyed it. The Sox beat the Yankees 5-4 to four in 11. Stay tuned now for the Legends of Golf next on NBC.